My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Friday, August 5th, 2016, and I'm here with Art Green at his home in Newton, Massachusetts, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Art, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, indeed you do. Great. So, as you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s in particular, and particularly your role in founding uh, the first Chabura, Chabura Shalom and it's the period of its early years. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background to set the stage for your involvement in the late 60s. So can we begin with your, tell me a little bit about your family when you were growing up. My family. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. My parents both came from Patterson, New Jersey. Um, family background is important somehow. Uh, my father, Martin Green, was uh, the first child of a couple who immigrated just before he was born. He was born the year after they arrived. He was born in 1907. They had arrived in 06. They came from Lodz, western Poland, but both the families had come from Stetlach before Lodz. Uh, in Lodz, his parents had both lost their Hasidic, the Hasidic religion of their parents and became quite secular. Uh, my grandfather a sort of, uh, sort of labor movement, secular, and my grandmother, also very secular. Her siblings were all Communist Party members. She was not a communist, but shared their view of religion. They were completely anti-religious, thought religion was the opiate of the masses. Dad was raised in a strictly atheist, secular household. Now that grandmother, as I like to say, uh, when I got underfoot as a little kid playing in the kitchen, she would say to me, Gai schlugen kapuris. Uh, and I asked her what that meant, I remember, and she said, and said, go swing a chicken around your head. I had no idea, it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard, I had no idea there was anything Jewish about it, but that's how Jewishly knowledgeable she was in her very secular, anti-religious world. Um, we were in Newark because Dad was a history teacher at Week Wake High School, that's the old Jewish public high school that Philip Roth describes in his novels, um, and that's what Dad did. He was a 30s intellectual, um, sociological, social and economic matters were what were important. Psychology, certainly anything spiritual was just all nonsense and bullshit. Um, and he felt very strongly about that. Um, he married my mother, Ethel, who was the daughter of a traditional, not orthodox, but traditional old world Jewish family also in Patterson. Uh, when I say traditional, not orthodox, means Grandpa's tarot shop was open on Shabbos. But upstairs from the tarot shop in Grandma's house, you couldn't sew, you couldn't write, she lit candles, everything was strictly kosher. Um, when they retired, he retired from the tarot shop when I was six years old, and they moved. And then he started going to shul every Shabbos and eventually shul every day. Maybe as much for the Yiddish conversation and schnapps and herring as for the davenan, which he knew by heart. He wasn't a great believer. She was a believer. He wasn't a great believer. But they were traditional Jews, traditional Balabatishkeit, sort of Yiddish-speaking Judaism was their world. Um, this is all, I'll give you all this detail about grandparents because they are very important in my life. Um, you had a sister also? My sister, I have an older sister named Paula, with whom I'm very close now. We were not terribly close as, as kids, but yes, the four of us lived in this apartment on South 28th Street in Newark. Um, when I was seven years old, mom developed cancer. Uh, we don't know exactly what kind of women's cancer it was called in those days. You didn't mention the C word, and you certainly didn't mention words like uterine in front of a child. Um, she died when I was 11. Um, and that was sort of the traumatic event of my childhood and probably the determinative event of the course of my life in many ways. Um, I remember going with. <laughs> if you could just um, not, I can. The microphone picks up when you're rubbing your hands on the fabric. Here. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Joe Ringer yesterday we kept going like this. <laughs> it's hard not to. <laughs> Something, right? I remember going to synagogue with my mother when I was maybe seven or eight years old. Uh, Friday night services at Temple B'nai Abraham, which was this big liberal temple in Newark. 
That's the place I went to Hebrew school. The rabbi there was Joachim Prince. He was a very well-known orator. People went Friday nights to hear Rabbi Prince speak and to listen to the Cantorio Choir concert. Nobody opened the book. I remember going with mom and opening the book and being interested in what was going on there. Why she and I were there, I'm not sure. Was she interested in religion? Was she less of an atheist than my father was? Or was she just escaping the cigar smoke of his Friday night bridge game at home? Hard to know. But when I was eight, dad took me aside and said, you have to do this terrible thing for your grandmother called Hebrew school because every boy in the family had to have a bar mitzvah. That was taken for granted in the Notkin family. This was the grandmother? My mother's mother, mother's right, mother. right. My sister received not a day of Jewish education because girls didn't need to, but I had to go to Hebrew school to please grandma. He said, if you hate it, you can quit. And I took to it like a duck to water. I loved it. I am a rare success story of the afternoon Hebrew school system. Three days a week, um, uh, in a very sort of Hebraist, labor Zionist um, atmosphere, uh, Ivrit be Ivrit. Uh, by my second or third year of Hebrew school, we had a pen pal in Israel and was exchanging letters with him in my broken Hebrew, which of course the teacher corrected. And it was all very exciting. I was, I just loved it. Now, partly the tough kids from elementary school weren't there. The tough kids, meaning the kids who beat you up, the Catholic kids, they were across the street being punished at Blessed Sacrament. Um, but uh, so in Hebrew school, you didn't have to pretend you didn't know the answers and things like that. It was my first exposure to a second language, and I was obviously good at language, and I just, I just loved it and thrived in it. Um, so that was... Something, uh, yeah, go ahead. I would say your childhood also coincided with the war, essentially. Well, I was born in 41. I remember, I don't remember the war or the end of the war, but I remember mom and grandma, again, mother's mother, sitting and looking at lists of survivors after the war, looking for a cousin who had been left behind. And I was there when that grandfather found out what had happened in his shtetl. A very traumatic memory somehow. And uh, so, the, yes, the background of the war was there. Dad was a history teacher, as I said. When I was 11 or 12, I read John Hershey's The Wall. I discovered something called the Black Book of Polish Jewry at a very young age, and that sort of told me what had happened in the war. What I didn't know and found out only very recently was that my father's family, the atheist side, the communist side of the family, whom we were out of touch with for many, many years, I just made contact three or four years ago with cousin Eleanor, a little older than I am, and she said, do you know about the other sibling? And I said, what are you talking about? She said, there was one brother who remained from, refused to come to America, and he and his wife and eight children died in the Lodge Ghetto. And nobody in the family ever mentioned that when I was a child. Did they try to get him out and fail? Did they say, who needs a, a, a crazy religious brother and left him there? I have no idea. But, uh, so that's, that's a piece of family history I found out only much, much later. Uh, so I was brought up in this um, secular home, it's not only secular, assimilationist home. I remember Christmas stockings. I hear we had a tree one year and Grandma had a fit, but I don't remember that. Um, but I remember Christmas stockings, ham steaks with pineapple rings on the kitchen table, you know, very, very trying to be American. Even my name, Arthur Elliott. I was named for dad's grandfather, who was Av Avramichik. I'm Avram Yitzhak, but that became Arthur Elliot in that generation. And, um, and assimilation was what my, what my dad, presumably my parents, wanted. When I applied to rabbinical school to jump ahead, I received a letter from Grandma Green, dad's mother. And the letter read like this. I still have it upstairs. I just showed it to somebody. Dear, in night school English, one sentence, Dear Arthur, I hear you still want to be a rabbi. I would be prouder of you if you would be a teacher and teach people things that are true. Because if there was a God in the sky, he would be shot down by Sputnik already. Period. That was, that was Grandma Green. This religion thing was all nonsense, and her son completely agreed. So he was horrified when I started taking to it. By the time Mom died... I was quite interested in religion. I remember try going to Minyan sometimes to say Kaddish for her, which Dad thought was an awful stupid thing to do. You'd be with all these old women crying, and who wants that? And that was his image of it. And um, But 
my grandparents hold, my mother's parents hold was very strong. They were wrecked when she died and their only son died two years later. This was, um, this was my son, the doctor, whom the tailor had put through medical school, dropped dead on the golf course at age 49. So my grandparents were completely devastated. And I was the grandchild who was interested in Yiddishkeit, who wanted to do Shabbos, who, who wanted to learn Yiddish. I would, I would go to my grandparents' house and read their Yiddish newspaper and try to figure out the Yiddish newspaper. How did you know enough Yiddish to even begin to do that? Well, they spoke Judeo-English, and I picked it up, and I was good with languages. In high school, I took two years of German in order to learn Yiddish. Um, and uh, so therefore, all right, go make your grandparents feel better. Go to them for this holiday. And dad, a year after mom died, started dating. Too soon, my grandmother would constantly say. And, um, and he wanted to be rid of me for a weekend, and so go to your grandparents. So I would say, Shabbos, at least once a month, every Jewish holiday, I was with my mother's parents in shul, in their shul which was an old world, old fashioned shul. Men and women sat together, but everything was in Hebrew and, uh, and the language among the congregants was Yiddish because I was the youngest person there by 40 years, pretty much. And it was a kind of very traditional old world kind of shul and I liked it. It was emotionally very real. Grandma cried the whole time, pretty much, especially on Yisker is my big memory of that shul. Grandma cries all day. Mrs. Markovich screamed every Yisker when her husband's name was read from the memorial tablet. And um, so I, uh, I grew up with that being very powerful. The summer I was 13, I went to Ramah for the summer. The summer I was 13, I went to Camp Ramah for the summer. That was very important. How did you now, to that's a good question. How did I get to Camp Ramah? Um, the last year I was at RRC in Philadelphia, I was president of RRC, the secretary calls and says, there's a man here who says he was your teacher, wants to talk to you. And Arie Ron, my Hebrew teacher from Newark, and his wife and another couple whom I knew came up to visit. They were in Philadelphia, decided to come visit. And Arie said to me something I had never known. He said to me, in the, the only language he ever spoke together in Hebrew, he says, Ani Shamarli over my dead body he'll go to Camp Ramah. Vanini Tsachtioto. I still remember your father who said over my dead body he'll go to Camp Ramah and I beat him. So then I understood Dad was getting married to Frida, my stepmother that year. He wanted his kid out of the house. Arye Ron said Camp Ramah. My father said absolutely not. And he didn't have another alternative and he let me go to Ramah. Um, and I took to it like a duck to water. I spent three summers in Ramah, the summers I was 13, 15, and 16. They became the center of my social life, of my intellectual life. Uh, my teachers in Ramah, the summers I was 15 and 16, were Yosef Yerushalmi and Gershon Cohen. The camp librarian uh, saw, I had never, because I came from Newark and not a day school, my Hebrew was quite good, but I'd never opened a page of Talmud. So the camp librarian says, I'll teach you a little Talmud. His name was David Weiss Halivni, uh, sort of the world's great Talmudist today. Um, when I was 15, I read Heschel, God in Search of Man and the Sabbath. They were the most profound thing I could ever imagine reading at age 15. Compared to what was going on in a public high school in a small town in New Jersey, this was on such a higher intellectual level that it just, it swept me away. And beginning after that summer when I was 13, I came home and started trying to be observant. Uh, wouldn't eat certain things, or what if I had to eat at my father's house, I would try to, I remember, wash my hands before eating, and Dad would, what's this sudden, what's this nonsense about wash, of washing your hands, and what's this nonsense, and what's that nonsense? We would fight furiously about religion. It was the way we fought out our adolescent battles, of course. Religion was a convenient battlefield between father and son, I realize in retrospect, but it was fierce nasty. He became very nasty and abusive, I would say, verbally abusive, which he turned out to be for quite a few years. And, um, and that, of course, pushed me farther and farther away from him, toward my grandparents, toward religion. I was a football, essentially, between those two families, between my father and my mother's parents. And I was attracted more and more to their world and more and more to religion. I became increasingly observant. 
um, not very psychologically self-aware, so that observance had a lot of guilt and a lot of compulsive behavior attached to it. And um, by the time I started Brandeis as a 16-year-old freshman, I was pretty much a budding Orthodox Jew, you would say. I was davening at least once a day, trying to daven three times a day. Uh, my, my freshman roommate reminds me that um, every time he wanted to go to the beach, I wanted to go study more Talmud or something like that. It was, I, was, I was in that place. Uh, at Brandeis, we had a very dynamic young Hillel director my freshman year, who only lasted one year. His name was Yitz Greenberg. And he was a big influence on me too, sort of pulling me more into that kind of orthodox self-understanding. So I moved in that direction. I was pulled that way. And, um, and let me just say, I was always attracted to the old world. Europe was very powerful in my imagination. The best thing Dad and I did when I was a kid was stamp collecting together. Dad had been a stamp collector as a kid and passed it on to me. Our favorite stamps were those of the Ukraine and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, those, those pictures of the Emperor Franz Josef uh, overprinted for use in this place and that place. And, and Dad was interested in Europe also. He said his master's thesis had been on Thomas Masaryk, the founder of Czechoslovakia, and he was very interested in European socialism. And so, attraction to the old, in Newark, I won't give you the details, there's a long chapter on this in my memoir, we shared a house with our Ukrainian neighbors upstairs who were our landlords, and so I learned to speak a little Ukrainian when I was a kid. So Ukrainian, Yiddish, old world stamps, old world stuff, uh, my grandparents' world, my grandfather's brother and sister-in-law we went to visit every Saturday night when I was at my grandparents' were Uncle David Mayer and Tante Shifra Sora, and they spoke only Yiddish. And so it was, I was pulled by that world. I was attracted to the world. Before I discovered Hasidism or sort of the spiritual teachings that were involved, I already had a foot and a half in Eastern Europe. And that all happened in the course of this relationship with grandparents and attraction to, attraction to that world. Did you find echoes of that attraction among your peers at all in those years? Or was that just something? No, I was a weird kid. <laughs> I was a weird kid. So when I met Halivni, I was attracted to his Yiddish accent, I imagine. Um, there were other people, certainly my Ramah friends, my Ramah and what was called LTF, that was Leaders Training Fellowship, which was the elite youth group of the conservative movement. They were all, we were all interested in Hebrew. We were all interested in, uh, in, um, in Jewish stuff, but not much in the Yiddish version of it. That was pretty unusual, even in that world. How about Zionism at that point? Zionism was a big part of that. The summer I was 13, I was just sharing this memory with an old friend. The summer I was 13, we met our first real Israelis, aside from our Hebrew teachers. And a lot of Zionist patriotism turns out that Tzvi and Miriam Vestreich, those Israelis, this friend reminded me, were survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto. And so romantic Zionism was the currency of the day. The first whole Hebrew book I ever read after uh, textbooks was Agnon's novella Bilvav Yamim, which I read when I was the summer I was 16. And I was sort of in love. I was in love with this romantic Zionism, that's a story about a, about a Hasidic young man in the 18th century who sails to Eretz Yisrael in a kerchief across the sea and longs for the true vision of Eretz Yisrael. And so that was very much part of the, the romantic Zionism, singing all these songs about, about the Amek and about the farmers and about the sunsets in Eretz Yisrael. That was all very much a part of my never been to Israel, but dreams of it, but dreams of it including some military stuff, Shira Palmach, but more attracted really to the sort of agricultural fantasy, kibbutz, um, and Agnon stories uh, world. That was, that was all there in that adolescent, in that adolescent vision. But the, but the Eastern European part, I would say, I think I was somewhat unique in that. So this was a 
Romantic decade, obviously, of the 60s. Uh, in your life, you had started Brandeis. That, over that period, you did your BA at Brandeis, you did a master's at JTS, right? Followed by... Well, I did rabbinical school at JTS. And then rabbinical school, yeah. right. So, can you sort of, sort of walk us through what you think of as the, sort of the highlights in your, uh, sort of your development um, uh, and personal evolution sort of Jewishly over that period? Sure. I, just I, want to, I want to keep time, obviously. I should say before each of these questions, how much time you got? Exactly. <laughs> but, so that's why I said okay. highlights, because we could go yes. through this, obviously, in tremendous detail. So freshman year, um, increasing orthodoxy, um, already Jewish studies courses at Brandeis. Nachum Glatzer became a teacher of mine my freshman year, and he was very impressive. Glatzer, who had been a Rosenzweig student, that year was a Bible course, was the course on Isaiah, but other things too. My sophomore year, something happened to me that changed my life. I decided increasingly that I was unhappy with religion, that it had been, I had been fooling myself with all this religion. And the eve of my 18th birthday, uh, March of whatever that year was, uh, 1958, I guess, I uh, went out and had, ate two Treif hamburgers in Waltham, and that was the end of my observance. I like to say that after the first hamburger, I might have repented, but after the second, I was finished. And um, why? I decided that it had all been fooling myself. It had all been more neurosis than faith. Um, this was my way of hiding from the world and dealing with my mother's death, which I had never come to terms with well. I didn't have real friends except the friends with whom I shared this Jewish obsession, but people who were really the kinds of thinkers and seekers I was, I was running away from. That year I kind of fell in love with a few people, and new friendships opened up, and, uh, and these were people outside the little Hillel world. They were, they were other people at Brandeis, a lot of them studying psychology. We were all reading Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving and The Little Prince that year, I remember. That was the big, the big discovery, self-discovery books. But that was also the year that I probably, you know, at Brandeis you could get the best Middle European education in North America. They were, all our significant teachers were Middle Europeans. I think I read Nietzsche in four or five different courses at Brandeis. Uh, in addition to Glatzer and Alexander Altman, who becomes important later in the story, uh, who taught Jewish studies, I had, I had philosophy with Herbert Marcuse and Aaron Gurvich. And it was just a very, a very highly intellectualized world. So Nietzsche was important because Nietzsche was the death of God and rejoicing. Once you broke out of that framework and that compulsive religion, you realized you didn't have to do it anymore. Uh, there was a great joy, a great liberation. God is dead. Um, but Nietzsche soon gives way to Kafka, which is to say God is dead, but so are you. Life is dead. There is no meaning. You are living in this barren universe of the castle or the trial and uh, and where do you go from here? And that's sort of the emptiness. Uh, I remember Sartre's No Exit. Um, I remember uh, uh, the sort of existential loneliness being part of the, of, of, of the self-description. And then reading Camus, well, you have to go and make meaning for yourself. You have to reconstruct meaning. I remember Nikos Kazantzakis was very important to me, a favorite writer of those days. You construct meaning for yourself. You go in the pilgrimage and you find meaning. So for those couple of years, my, the end of my sophomore and junior year in college, I considered myself a Jewish secularist, all right? That's, I was very involved in Jewish life still. I was very, I had taken so many Jewish studies courses at Brandeis, I'd almost completed the major already. I thought of switching my major from Jewish, Jewish studies to Complet to comparative literature, Western literature. I sometimes think that I walked away from Judaism at that point in my life successfully. I probably would have been a literature professor, maybe Russian and German or German and English, something like that, and, and studied existentialism and loneliness in modern literature and things like that. Um, but I'd done so much of Jewish studies already, and I loved it so much, even though I was secular. So I tried secular Judaism. I became president. I became head of the Student Zionist Organization of Greater Boston. I started going to meetings of the Yiddish Kultur Club in Boston and bringing down the age, average age in the Yiddish Kultur Club by 60 years or so, going to their lectures. I remember once hearing Soloveitchik lecture to the secular Yiddishists. Very fascinating experience. And I was trying on secular Jewish identity for size. 
uh, those were just important years in personal growth too, in sort of coming out of my shell and, and discovering who I was. Had you met Zalman also in those? Early I had met Zalman already my freshman year. Um, Yitz Greenberg brought Zalman to do a Shabbaton at Brandeis, and I was very impressed by Zalman, who was still a good Lubavitcher chassid in those days. Um, that was my first contact with chassidism per se, was Zalman representing Lubavitch. But then I became quite secular, quite rebellious, but still interested in studying Jewish, Jewish things. Um, my, soft, my junior year at Brandeis, Alexander Altman came from London to be professor of Jewish philosophy. He taught a course called Classical Jewish Thought, in which he taught major Jewish ideas from the biblical, rabbinic, philosophic, and mystical perspectives. And there I first encountered Kabbalah. My senior year in college, he taught the first course on Kabbalah ever taught in the American University, uh, Intro to Jewish Mysticism, when I was in that class. At, by that point, I was turning 20, 19 or 20, I realized I was still a seeker, I was still a religious person. I still had religious questions, even though I didn't accept any of the answers I had given myself in adolescence, I was still interested in religious questions. I was still in this business for ultimate meaning, not just for Jewish cultural, you know, cultural education. Uh, Glotzer was helpful, because Glotzer got me to read Buber and Rosenzweig, of course. And um, my senior year, somebody, either Altman or Zalman, more likely Zalman, maybe Altman, gave me an essay by Hillel Zeitlin. Hillel Zeitlin was a neo-Hasidic thinker, died in the Warsaw Ghetto, around the way to Treblinka, and uh, Zeitlin had written an essay called Yisodota Hasidut, The Fundaments of Hasidism. I read that essay in Hebrew, and I fell in love. I said, this will be my religious language the rest of my life. This is a Judaism that's not about guilt and it's not about how much do you observe and not about worrying about did you turn a light on on Shabbos or did you carry a handkerchief in your pocket. This is a Judaism that's about very profound ideas and, and spiritual quest. And this will be my religious language. I said I promised myself I would translate that essay into English and I would spend my life studying this stuff. And that was it. That was it. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I graduated Brandeis in, in, in the 61, spring 61, and I went to Israel for a year to study with Sholem. I just sit in on Sholem's lectures. I took a Targil in Zohar, a readings course in Zohar, one of Sholem's students, Rivka Schatz. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. That was pretty much set by then. I was already starting to read Hasidut. I think my copy, my copy of Sefer Baal Shem Tov, a book of the Baal Shem Tov's teachings, says 1960 next to my name in it. Tafresh uh, Kaf in Hebrew, and so I know I was already reading that stuff my senior year in college. Um, so that was it. That had sort of made the decision for me. What about the American counterculture and, and sort of what was going on in the larger world? What kind of an impact and interaction, if any, did you have with that? First American of all, let me say something about going back to Dad. Dad was an American liberal, an American leftist, socialist leanings, but essentially an American liberal. And I was raised in that kind of liberal internationalist household. Uh, he subscribed to the nation. We sort of talked about ideas all the time. Dad wanted to talk about ideas. He wanted to raise his son to be a liberal intellectual. And that was part of my upbringing. Um, and it never left me. Brandeis, sophomore, Brandeis junior, senior year, I participated in the in the civil rights pickets, uh, we picketed Woolworths in Roxbury to try to convince African Americans in Roxbury to picket Woolworths because they were discriminating at lunch counters in the South. That was sort of taken for granted that you were part of this, of this liberal, leftist leaning way of thought. Uh, Max Lerner was teaching at Brandeis and Irving Howe and all these people represented that political culture, and I felt myself completely a part of that political culture. There was no sense at all that my Judaism was in conflict with that. My Judaism was sort of liberal Judaism. Israel was very progressive, and, and there was no conflict about that at all. Um, Glotzer and Altman didn't talk about their politics. Whether they shared those politics, I don't know, but I certainly did. Um, by the time I was a rabbinical student at JTS, so I was at... I was at JTS from 1962 to 67. The Vietnam War was becoming a big issue, and then things began to change. We were moving 
we were moving in that leftist direction. Um, I was certainly against the war very early, but my culture hero Heschel was against the war too. Heschel was the co-head of the clergy concerned about Vietnam. So we were, we stu I, I, let's say, uh, some of us students were leftist, and we were with Heschel, outraged that most of the faculty thought Heschel should shut up, because if we oppose the war, what will Nixon do to Israel, dot, dot, dot. And so Jews have no, ha are not in a position to protest, and I was outraged by that. I remember my fourth year at the seminary, I had a certain Talmud professor who would say things that uh, make comments about the war and about the Schwarzes and about things like that, and racist comments. And I said, if I heard those things from my kosher butcher, I'd have to put up with them, but I will not listen to them from my, from my Talmud teacher. And I started cutting his classes regularly because I just couldn't stand listening to his, his political opinions. So by the mid 60s, I was becoming somewhat more radicalized, I would say. Uh, certainly, certainly uh, thinking again, Heschel was a fine example that that was, that was the Jewish thing to do. Of course, if you were Jewish, you should be on the left. That was just taken for granted. But he was rare, as you say. He was rare, but I was completely, that was completely, that was of a piece for me, I want to say. Yes. And that's important when we get to the Havra. That was all of a piece for me. That is to say, being counterculture to American bourgeois values. American bourgeois values something we look down on. Going back to Brandeis already. Going back to Brandeis, 1961, we weren't hippies, yet we were still beatniks. These were, you know, the girls were wearing the long black stockings and the boys with the torn jeans, and we sort of, this was sort of beat identity. And yes, we looked down on American bourgeois values, including the American synagogue which was this bourgeois place, the ladies with the mink coats and the, and, 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 and the rich guys who would show up once a year. That was what the American synagogue was. And that was hypocrisy, um, uh, bourgeois values, um, uh, anti-personal liberation. Personal liberation meant, meant discovering who you were. And that might mean sexual exploration or that might just mean reading kinds of unconventional things. I like to say that I walked into JTS with, um, in one pocket of my jeans, a copy of Allen Ginsberg's Howell, in the other pocket, a copy of the Kedushat Levi, uh, Levi Yitzhak of Bredichev, and both were equally unwelcome at the seminary. Um, yes, I was, reading, I was reading Ginsberg already by my senior year in college, I think, or whenever Howell and Kaddish first came out. Um, so I sort of saw myself as part of that world of, of protest against the shallowness of American life and American culture and American Judaism. Again, Heschel agreed with all of that condemnation of American, particularly of American Judaism. And so I was looking for something more profound as an alternative. That profundity for me came spiritually out of Hasidism, but also out of people like Alan Watts and others who were already writing about the new journey to the East spirituality. We had all read Hermann Hesse, of course, as, as sophomores in college, and, um, and then had moved toward Dr. Suzuki and studying and reading about Zen Buddhism and reading Alan Watts, The Discovery of Indian Spirituality, and so on. And that went along with a political condemnation of the shallowness of American bourgeois culture and values. Um, and that those bourgeois values people were also supporting a disgusting war in Vietnam, which was clearly uh, destroying a relatively innocent uh, people who were seeking their own liberation. That was pretty clear to us. By the late 60s was becoming pretty awful. That political culture was interrupted, I should say, by another political cause of around 1965, and that was discovering the cause of Soviet Jewry. While I was a rabbinical student at JTS, I became one of the early leaders of something called the Triple SJ, the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. Uh, I discovered a fellow named Jacob Birnbaum around Yeshiva University, who was the founder of it, and I was one of the first people, along with Hillel Levine and a couple of others, to try to bring it out of the Orthodox ghetto. Heschel was very encouraging of that. Heschel, too, felt Soviet Jewry was a cause we needed to take up. And young Eli Wazel, whom I'd originally met through Zalman, the same day Zalman introduced me to Kathy, uh, she introduced, he introduced me to Zalman, to Eli Wazel.
That was summer of 1964. And so Heschel and Wiesel were very encouraging of our activism for Soviet Jewry. And that became an important cause in my life for two or three years. I didn't abandon that cause, but I, I became somewhat disillusioned with that cause when I discovered that a lot of the young people around me who were organizing the rallies that I was going to for Soviet Jewry were also supporters of Mayor Kahana and represented this sort of lower middle class New York Jewish population who were struggling against, uh, against something other than just the Soviet Jewry cause. They were struggling against the left. Well, they, were go they were going to wind up Rudy, Rudy Giuliani supporters and so on. And I sort of sniffed that by 1967, 68. It became a little bit disillusioned with the kinds of bedfellows I had in the Soviet Jewry cause. I was often disillusioned. I was often suspicious of bedfellows. Uh, in the Soviet Jewry cause, I became suspicious of bedfellows on the right, and I sort of pulled back from that cause because of it. Of course, by 1968 or 69, all the federations in the Jewish establishment had taken up Soviet Jewry. They didn't need people like me anymore. But a few years later, I was going to early meetings of Brera, uh, very attracted to, uh, after 67, the great crisis of 67 and post-67. By 69, I was clearly outraged by the settlement movement on the West Bank and by, and by the messianic um, Jewish triumphalism you were beginning to hear. And Brera was organized, and I started going to Brera meetings. My friend Max Sichten was a founder of Brera and others. But then Brera was, it turns out, a coalition of people like ourselves who loved Israel but were very concerned about its moral course and Jewish old lefties, leftovers from my father's Zionist uh, communist relatives who had always hated Israel and were using the old-time Bundists and old-time Jewish communists who were using the new Israeli aggression in, or, or settlement building, let's say, to, as a way of denouncing Israel, which they'd never liked. And I was very uncomfortable being in bed with those people. So I stayed on the edge of Rira and did not get very involved. So in both directions, I was nervous about what kinds of political allies do you make? I, I, I constantly argue with one of our graduates of the rabbinical school I now run, who works for Jewish Voice for Peace. And I say, what kinds of bedfellows do you have? Who are you in bed with? Who are you, who are you planning rallies with? If you're planning rallies together with, with Hamas supporters, then I can't have anything to do with you. Uh, you know, the, sort of asking that question of who else, who else is, who else, who's your next door neighbor at that rally you're a part of? So I've been asking that question for a long time. Yeah. What about, um, can you talk a little bit about your, the, the evolution of, and development of your relationship with Heschel that became so important for you? while you were at JTS, and part of the impetus for your uh, starting Havrat Shalom. Heschel. So as I said, I read Heschel when I was 15 years old. It was wonderful, it was brilliant. I got to JTS in 1962. Uh, I was very much a sort of counterculture type by then, you might say, and saw myself as a very independent learner. It was an awful place. They were taking attendance in classes. Nobody had done that to me since junior high school. It was there, there was so much that was offensive about the way students were put down and, and treated badly. I was a pretty successful student, but others in my class weren't, and were, I could see them being harmed in many ways at that institution. The details are not, are not important for us. I was ready to walk out after one year, and my Talmud teacher, Seymour Siegel, with whom I had a somewhat complicated, uh, to, to have somewhat complicated feeling, said to me, if you had a pro private program with Abraham Heschel, would you stay? And I said yes, and he arranged for me to be Heschel's private student, which meant I was exempt from all my practical rabbinics courses, the homiletics and so on, and I studied privately with Heschel, meeting with him, I think bi-weekly, if I remember rightly, and also was uh, in a little seminar with Heschel and several other students. So I became Heschel's student for four years. That was a great privilege. I did not go along with everything Heschel said. By then I had rebelled against religion, so I had rebelled against Heschel too, and thought sometimes Heschel was just lost in his own beautiful language and, and pretty words, and, and, and was there really any substance behind it? I was questioning of Heschel, and 
but I was, but I was, it was a great privilege to study with him. Um, I'll tell you about the last conversation I had with Heschel. Several years after I graduated, he died in 72, so this must have been 1971. I said, Professor Heschel, it never quite worked with us, did it? When I needed a Rebbe, you wanted to be a professor. When I wanted a professor, you needed to be a Rebbe. Um, so Heschel asked me to, Heschel gave me a huge assignment, which was a wonderful assignment. I'm eternally grateful for that assignment to read a certain Kabbalistic volume in Hebrew and to write a paper about it. And I wrote him a hundred page paper in Hebrew. And I don't think he ever read it. And I would say, Professor Heschel, have you read my paper yet? Do you have any comments on my work on Ibn Gabai? And he would say, oh, so how are you? In this ultimate existential way. And then I would say, Professor Heschel, I'm having trouble. I just don't know if I believe in prayer. My prayer is so hard for me. You would say, have you read my Monodies, part two, chapter 21? Uh, you know, it was sort of this back and forth game. Some people wanted to be Heschel's disciple. I was afraid of giving myself to a Rebbe. I had two great candidates who wanted to be my Rebbe, Heschel and Zalman. And I never let myself be a disciple of either one of them. I was just too afraid of discipleship, too afraid of giving myself over to anybody. Maybe, uh, you know, a shrink would say this had something to do with my father, who was authoritarian, and once I had rebelled, I needed to be away from authority figures. But whatever it was, I just could not give myself entirely. Nevertheless, I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to study with Heschel. I've been teaching Heschel for the last 50 years. I've been having ongoing conversations with Heschel, unfortunately one-sided, for the last 50 years. If you look at the footnotes to my book, Radical Judaism, and especially to the footnotes and now of the new Hebrew edition, which I just sent the final version of off to the publisher yesterday, you'll see I'm still arguing with Heschel and still learning from Heschel. So he's been very important, even though my theology diverges from him in some ways. The combination of deep spirituality and activism and the fact that spirituality calls for an active life and so on, that's right out of Heschel. So... Why don't we get to this seminar that you took uh, with him in the final year of your studies at JTS and the meeting with so you've re- So you've read about this, you've read this story, yes. Indeed, so, but I want you to tell it. Yes. So when we were, there were about six of us in Heschel's seminar. that met in his office, which was a very smoke-filled room. Heschel smoked big cigars. We called them Heschel specials. And, uh, and the room was full of cigar smoke. He was not a very good pedagogue. He was wonderful, a wonderful figure to be with. We walk into a seminar one evening, about the six of us, and there's this fellow sitting in a turtleneck shirt whom we've never seen before. And Heschel says, I want you all to meet my friend Dan Berrigan. Dan and Heschel were the co-chairs of something called Clergy Concerned About Vietnam, which was the religious opposition to the Vietnam War. And we'd all known the name Dan Berrigan. I knew the name Dan Berrigan by then. And Heschel said, Father Berrigan is here this evening to convince me to go to jail with him. They were about to pour blood on draft files or something like that and get arrested for it. And your assignment this evening is to decide whether I should go to prison or not. Well, Heschel had already had his first heart attack. He looked ancient, although he was only about 60, in his early 60s. And we were all very protective of him. Of course, immediately the Emerson Thoreau conversation uh, in here, out there, was in the background. We were talking about that. And we were convincing Heschel that he, should, he could do more for the cause out here rather than in there. I'm not sure if we were right or not, but um, that was the assignment. And then after that, Heschel turns to Berrigan and says, so tell us what's going on in the Catholic Church. And Dad Berrigan gave us a very 1966 version, just immediate post-Vatican II, or in the midst of Vatican II, of the great changes happening in the church, the Catholic worker movement and Dorothy Day. And the great parish is going to have to break up because there are no priests for them. So the Catholic Church will have to give way and allow for non-celibate monasticism. And these new monastic communities will become the kernel of a renewed church. And that the church will be reborn out of these communities. And it was all very, and they would be workers' communities. It was all very exciting to me. I'm still excited by that vision. I want you to know this morning at 5 o'clock in the morning, I was writing to my, student, Eb, my students, Eben and Ariel, something that comes directly out of that vision. Because we're talking about creating such communities yet again in 2016. So that's how formative this all was to me and remains to me.
and and um, Berrigan then turns around and says, so tell me what's happening in the Jewish community. And I was immediately struck by this great embarrassment. Nothing is happening in the Jewish community. The Jewish community is dull, self-satisfied, still living in the edifice complex of building these great suburban synagogues that are empty and spiritually vacuous. And the Jewish community is identified with upper middle class culture and pushy, get, a, get ahead, addicted to the great drug of American Jewish life, which is the drug of success and high status achievement. And that's what's happening. I don't know if I, I, didn't, I don't think I made that speech, but that's what I felt was happening in the Jewish community. I have enough self respect not to, not to say that out loud to Berrigan, probably. Uh, and I just said to myself as I came out of that evening, somewhat, somewhat zonked, I said, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to start a different kind of Jewish community. There has to be a Jewish community for people of our generations that will have different values, and that will be a kind of like this, like this uh, non, non, non-celibate monasticism that he's talking about. Now, by then, I had already read an essay by Zalman Schachter called Toward an Order of B'nai Or, published in Judaism magazine 1964, where Zalman talked about wanting to create a Jewish monastic, non celibate monastic order. Um, Solomon by that time had broken with Chabad, was seeking a new Jewish identity. That's a lot of details to be filled in there. Um, but Zalman wrote an essay on a new Jewish religious order that he would like to create. It was to be called B'nai Or. We would live more or less communally. We would work eight hours a day at spiritual, at spiritual life, at prayer and devotion and, and spiritual creativity. And he began talking about this, and he began going from place to place. When he came to New York, he would tell us about various people who wanted to be part of this spiritual community. And he would talk about Brother Joe in Minneapolis and Sister Crandall in, in Chicago and Sister Dvorah in Chicago. This is Sister Crandall, she's sitting next to me. Um, we met, Zalman introduced us in 1964 in the context of two people who would like to be part of this spiritual community, this, this Jewish monastic community that he would like to create. So you had been in contact with him yes. over that period as well? I can tell you more about that if you want, me, if you want to know, yes, a bit. Um, as I said, Yitz brought him when I was a freshman in college. When I was a senior in college, I was president of Hillel. I brought Zalman back. For a weekend at Hillel, I hated him. I thought he was a phony. Um, at the end of a long weekend, I sort of parted with him in despair. And he said to me, as I tried to pour out my soul to him, he said to me, the Rabbani Shalom is playing with your neshama like a yo-yo. And something in the back of my mind said, fuck you if that's all you have to say. And I walked away from him very hurt and disappointed. Two years later, three years later, I met him in the cafeteria at JTS where he was visiting my class, my dear classmate, Neil Rose, who became a lifelong friend. And I said, Zalman Shafter, I've hated your guts for two years for telling me God's playing with my soul like a yo-yo. What are you going to do about it? And that was the beginning of our real relationship, and we became friends. It was immediately set up so that he was not to become my Rebbe. It, was, it, was, it began with a challenge to him. And then we began a series of conversations that have never ended. And Zalman was very important to me. And a year after that conversation, I guess, he introduced me to Kathy, he introduced me to B'nai Or. Neil Rose and I were both interested in joining that community. He was talking about Neil and Carol were married then. And Kathy and I were introduced in that context. And there were several other people who were interested in this community, apparently, or maybe. At least, fantasy, at least in Zalman's fantasy, we're interested in this community. Um, so that was in the background. So when I heard Dan Bear again, there was some echo of a Zalman conversation in the background there already, yes. When I graduated JTS in 1967, Zalman was interested in creating that community in Winnipeg, where he lived. I was not interested in going to Winnipeg. There was one job in Winnipeg as Zalman's assistant at the university. Neil Rose took that job and lived in Winnipeg for the next 30 or 40 years. Kathy and I instead moved to, moved to Boston. But the background of both 
Zalman's vision of B'nai Or and that conversation with Dan Berrigan were somewhere planted in my head by the time I moved to Boston in the summer of 1967. And what were you coming to Boston for at that point? That was strong enough to pull you away from... The yes, I, I, just, I wanted to get a doctorate. Remember, JTS had really been preparation for doctoral work in Jewish mysticism. That's what I wanted to do. Um, there was some thought of going back to Israel or staying in Israel and getting a doctorate there. Everybody said, Sholem hates Americans and his, treats his students miserably. Um, so Alexander Altman, my teacher at Brandeis, was offering a doctorate in Jewish mysticism at Brandeis. And I went back to Brandeis to study with Altman. Um, here's a, a scene I'd like to share with you. Oh, maybe January or February 1968. I'm sitting in the Brandeis cafeteria with two other first-year doctoral students, Michael Fishbane and Paul Mendes Flor. The three of us are sitting there having coffee in the Castle cafeteria. I look up, and there's a kid I'd known as an undergraduate who was suddenly walking into the Castle cafeteria. But... What was he doing there? So I get up and say, Abby Hoffman, what are you doing here? And Abby says to me, well, we're looking for some people to cut up next summer at the Democratic Convention, 1968 Convention. Do you want to come join us? And I looked around and I shared Abby's attitude toward the things happening politically and toward the war and so on. And I looked back at Buzzy and Paul and said, I just started graduate school here. I think I'll stay here and not do that. It felt, just felt like a moment to me, you know, but I could have gone with Abby Hoffman. I had known Abby fairly well, and I, we were close, but I'd known him fairly well, and other, we had a lot of friends in common in that world of the Brandeis counterculture by 1968, very anti-war people. Uh, but I had just started the doctoral program. So in the middle of that year, I'd been thinking about, you know, maybe starting some different kind of synagogue, counter-synagogue, counter-culture, Jewish something. I didn't know what it was called or what form it would take. Sometime that winter, I get a call from Alan Mintz. Alan Mintz, who's now a professor of Hebrew literature at JTS. I had known him when he was a U.S. wire in the 1960s from Worcester. I remember counseling him on whether he should run for national president of U.S. Y. Alan says to me, how would you like to start a yeshiva to keep your friends out of the draft? And I said, what do you mean? And we talked about it for just a few minutes, the idea that a yeshiva could give draft deferments. Draft deferments were very important in 1967-68. It was before the numbers came out. Anybody could be drafted. Or maybe it was the year of the numbers. 69. Yeah, okay. And I said, that's interesting. And maybe a few days later, I walked into Al Axelrad's office and said, Al, how'd you like to be a Rosh Hashiva with me? Uh, How long had Al been there at that time? Al had been at Brandeis since sometime during my JTS years. I'm not sure. He'd been there a, a year or two anyway, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I'd like to be at Rosh Hashiva. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, maybe I'm thinking about starting a yeshiva that will give draft deferments and that will do some kind of Jewish learning. And I didn't know exactly what. And he liked the idea. We talked about it a little bit. He never became really involved, but he liked the idea, supported me in it. And it sort of churned around in my mind. I'm sure I discussed it with Kathy at the time. You were married by then. We were married mid-May of that year. We got married in May 68. We were both living in Boston. Nominally, we were living separately. I was rooming in Cambridge with a fellow named Mooney Berenbaum, Michael Berenbaum, who is a well-known Holocaust scholar now. Um, Mooney and I were living together, and Kathy was living with some with some female friends. This was to please Kathy's grandmother, but we were in fact all living in Cambridge. And then in May of that year we got married. But uh, we, were, we began talking about it, and I began talking to a few people about it. What do you think about this idea of starting the yeshiva? So there were a few peers I talked to about it. Al was the first one. I'm sure I mentioned it to Ben Gold and and at some point, to Joe Lukinsky, who was the assistant rabbi at KI, at Kehot Israel at Brookline, and had been a mentor of mine in the 60s. Um, at some point, I'm sure I mentioned it to Everett Gendler, though he was off in Princeton and was not in the immediate scene. Um, no, no, Everett was then in Mexico. I'm sorry, Everett was then in Cuernavaca, not important. Um, 
And I began talking to a few young people, younger people I knew about it who might be members of such a community. Uh, one of them was Barry Holtz, whom I'd known since he was 13, uh, through connections related to USY and so on. Um, one of them was, there was this, I had to take elementary Latin, because Altman, if you're going to be in medievalist, you have to know medieval Latin and medieval Arabic. So I was in Latin class. There was this red-headed kid sitting next to me in Latin class named Michael Brooks. He was an undergraduate, and I was a first-year graduate student. Um, and uh, I talked to him about it. He sounded interested. What kind of people were you looking for, do you think, or sounding out? People with strong Jewish interests, people, bright people, strong Jewish interests, uh, wanting to learn. For me, this was immediately about Jewish learning. It wasn't, the draft deferment was an excuse, a way to get people to do this. Why would people take a year or take a couple of years to do this? Well, it was getting them out of the draft, but I was interested in getting people to create some kind of alternative Jewish community. I didn't know exactly what. Alternative. Did you take the idea of a seminary seriously? In the sense of... Yes, yes. Because I'd been so wounded by the experience of JTS that the idea that there could be another way to teach this stuff, another way to train what Jewish spiritual leader should be. I didn't know if it would be the word rabbi. I didn't like the word rabbi much in those days. I thought it was very corrupt. I almost turned down JTS's degree because I felt the rabbi that had been so corrupted in America. Uh, of course, I was then glad I did it because I couldn't have done this draft deferment thing without it. But, um, but I was really interested in creating some kind of spiritual community. I guess I would have said some kind of spiritual brotherhood, not noticing the sexism of that word from those days, some kind of spiritual brotherhood, um, uh, some kind of definitely a community that's about learning. I was definitely looking for a different approach to Jewish learning. That year and the year after I was teaching study groups on, Has on Hasidism for Brandeis Hillel and for Harvard Hillel and getting some very ex interesting, bright young people in those groups, getting them excited about studying text. And that was probably a year or two later, actually, 68, 69. Um, so I remember talking to a few people about it, and they all sort of got interested. Uh, I remember uh, Barry must have been early in the process, maybe. And so Joe Reamer yesterday described your coming to New York to Queens, I think, to speak with him and his parents about it. Yes, but how did he first hear about it? I don't know if there was a Ramah connection or... Um... You have to ask Joe how he heard about it first. Um, so I remember Barry, I remember, I remember Michael Brooks sitting next to me in Latin class. Joe got interested very early, I don't remember how. Ben Gold said to me, I have this young man who's a draft counselor at, at Harvard Hillel, and I think he might be interested. His name was Jim Kogel. Um, and I still have, I found in the Chavarat Shalom files, Jim Kugel's letter, where he writes to me and says, no, he wasn't yet a draft counselor at Harvard Hill. He became a draft counselor at Harvard Hill after that. Because he writes me this letter and says, I don't know much about Judaism because I went to an Episcopal boarding school, but I'd like to learn. And if you are creating this community, I'd be interested in joining. It's a very touching letter from Jim Kugel, maybe a senior at Yale or something like that. And then he came to Harvard Hill and worked as a draft counselor for Ben. Um, Hillel's in those days had draft counselors on staff. Huh. Uh, so we began to think about a group of people and exactly what we would do in this community, what its nature would be, was not clear. We did not have the word Chavura in our vocabulary yet. Um, this thing, this new synagogue, this synagogue seminary, Yes, it had to be seminary to give a deferment. You couldn't get a deferment of being a synagogue. So once we're talking about draft deferment, we're talking about seminary. It was counter-seminary, counter-cultural seminary, counter-seminary. It would be a different kind of seminary, different values. Uh, to jump ahead a year, in maybe 1969, Judaism Magazine ran a symposium on rabbinic education in America. They invited representatives of the three denominational seminaries, and two upstarts who had just started new seminaries. Ira Eisenstein had just founded RRC in Philadelphia, and Art Green had just founded Chavrat Shalom in Boston. And I was 
the junior in the group by, by, by several decades. And we were asked to talk about rabbinic education, what it should be. And I, it's printed in Judaism in 1600. I gave this Heschelian radical uh, self-righteous speech. The problem with the rabbis in America is they earn too much money and they share the same bourgeois values as their congregants. And the rabbi that has to be about prophecy and justice and, and, um, and tearing down the old fabric of society and building a new society. And that was the kind of rubric I was thinking in in 1968. It was revolutionary. We use the word revolutionary about ourselves all the time, probably too casually. Did we mean political revolutionary or spiritual revolutionary? The answer was absolutely yes. Um, we meant both. I was probably more interested in the spiritual side than the political side, but, but was completely open to both. Um, and, so, and so this language of creating some kind of new Jewish seminary community, a community of intense learning. I meant the learning very seriously. I don't want anybody to think that the seminary was just an excuse for draft deferments. Not at all. The draft deferment was a way to create this, it was an opportunity to create this community I was interested in creating. Were the people that you were uh, sort of pulling in to this community, in fact, interested in, in the rabbinate in general, or were they basically just very interested Jews, and this was... Very oh. interested Jews, interested in Jewish learning, liked the idea of intense learning. Mm -hmm. I would say seekers, intellectual types, seeker types. They did not especially want the rabbinical degree, no. They would be willing to be in something called a rabbinical school in order to get the deferment. They liked the idea of studying, and liked the idea of engagement with community, now, 1968, commune is a word that people are using. We're hearing about young people going to Vermont and creating communes. You drop out, you leave the world behind you, and you go create a commune in Vermont with a lot of dope, and we haven't talked about that yet, a lot of dope and a lot of, and a lot of uh, maybe free love and a lot of genuine creating a new brotherhood of humanity, a new, a new way of living, a new way of thinking about what interpersonal relations mean. That was all the sort of rhetoric of the age, and we were part of it. Theodore Rozak, The Making of a Counterculture, was a big book for us. But so was the Harad experiment, which was sort of sexual fantasy community around, around to take place around Cambridge. Um, and uh, other sort of models of community, uh, Eastern, uh, impact of Eastern religion and thinking about what you were after. In this. Impact of Eastern religion, a little bit, the Zen monastery was sort of it there. The Eastern religion we knew about by then was, the Eastern religion, the Eastern religion we knew about by then was Zen Buddhism. We didn't know much about Indian religion yet, I don't think, though. We were reading Alan Watson, he, and he was Indian religion, sort of neo-Indian religion. Um, by 68 or 69, Shlomo had created the House of Love and Prayer in San Francisco, more or less parallel to us. That was another piece of this count, Jewish counterculture vision. Um, and the romanticized Hasidic community. We all were readers of Buber's Tales. And in Buber's Tales, the Hasidic community looked like something very beautiful and very touching. Um, the fact that it was a mostly male community was something that wasn't too much on our radar screen yet, but we certainly would welcome women to be part of it. So all of those, all of those sort of went into a vision of what this new community was, and the people who were interested in joining this group were all very excited about that vision of new community, all very excited about it being deeply Jewish and deeply intellectual and involved with study, that was fine. Rabbinate, well, okay. It doesn't mean they wanted to become rabbis in the sense of we thought of rabbis in synagogues. For most of us, it would have been, God forbid, for me too. I never could imagine myself in a congregational rabbinate, um, but... But the learning part sounded good. In that first cohort or so, were many of the, the members of that first cohort also engaged in external study in other universities and sort of with other career goals, in fact, in mind at that point? Yes, we'd have to think about them one by one and try to remember and exactly when did they become 
involved in those extra career goals? Did they come to the Chavurah and then find those other things? I don't remember. I'm not very good at remembering the details of exactly whose biography went how. Barry Holtz is terrific at that if you're going to talk to him. Um, he will remember the details of exactly who did what and what sequence. But in your mind, as you were imagining this community, was it one that was absolutely at the center of people's lives, taking up the bulk of their time and energies, or was it? It, it was to be central to people's lives, but you could do something else at the same time, because we knew people had to do something to help make a living. We knew we had no money. And even though we were all Luftsmenschen and people willing to live on the margins of society and the margins of the economic world, you still had to do something. So I was a doctoral student at Brandeis. I hadn't dropped out of my doctoral program. Other people, Buzzy Fishbein was going to be this. He wasn't going to drop out of graduate school either. Um, and if Michael Brooks wanted to start a program in classics or whatever it was, or Barry was doing his doctorate, I think, already in English at Tufts, if I remember rightly, and other people might have part-time jobs, that was okay. You, everybody would get a job to make some money teaching Hebrew school or Hebrew high school or running youth groups. I was doing that to make a living. And so it was assumed you would do some work. It might be assumed you would do some other study. When we created Chavurah Shalom, I think to be a full-time member of the Chavurah, you had to be taking, if I remember rightly, three courses. And those three courses would meet for three hour, hour and a half sessions during the week. It would also be assumed that you would come to a communal meal once a week and a, commun and a community meeting once a week. And we would do some form of Shabbat together. That's what it required. But the rest of your time, you could be and probably would be doing something else. And that was okay. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about just some more detail about how you went about... Um, sort of getting this idea off the ground, since in many ways you're the repository, you're, you're the one, you're the source. Hey, um, let me say a word about the, about the name, Chavurah Shalom. Please. Uh, we did, we're not yet thinking Chavurah. The word Chavurah was not in our vocabulary. Now, after the fact, once we became well-known, two claimants came along and said, oh yes, you took it from us. The Reconstructionists, it turns out, were using the word Chavurah in the 1960s. I was quite unaware of that. And Jack Neusner, who, was, who had written a book called Fellowship in Judaism, talked about the Chavurah in first century Judaism. And he said, you took it from me. And as far as I remember, neither of those is true. Being interested in this ongoing issue of communal efforts in Jewish history, counter communities and so on, I came across a group that existed in 18th century Jerusalem called Ahavat Shalom. Ahavat Shalom was a brotherhood of Kabbalists who lived in Jerusalem, disciples of men named Rabbi Shalom Sharabi in 18th century Jerusalem. And they wrote a, a document, a kind of covenant among themselves about how they would share their lives. It was very beautiful, and I found it that year. And it made a big impression on me, Ahavat Shalom. And I remember once Kathy and I were traveling to New York, this is now in the spring of 68. And we stopped in New Haven on the way back to visit Dick and Sherry Israel, who were friends. Dick was the Hill director at Yale. And I told Dick about this idea, this new community we wanted to create. And he said, what are you thinking of calling it? And I said, the name that's in our mind now is Kehilat Kodesh. And Dick said, that's the most pretentious thing I ever heard in my life. And so it couldn't be called Kehilat Kodesh. And then somehow in my mind, Ahavat Shalom morphized to Chavurat Shalom. And Chavurat Shalom was really named after this Ahavat Shalom community in 18th century Jerusalem. And how that happened, Ahavat Shalom, Chavurat Shalom, it just sort of clicked in my mind. Uh, I don't think any other Chavurot were in the background, but it could be. Um, so we had this idea, Chavurat Shalom Community Seminary. That's what we're going to call it. We're both community and seminary. And both of those, those two pillars of we are creating a new kind of community. We're creating a new kind of seminary. It's about living and it's about learning. It's about the love for one another and the, and the fellowship we're going to create among ourselves. And the learning will be part of that and we'll direct that and we'll shape that. All of that was our rhetoric. So in that spring of 1968, I start looking for people. As I said, Michael Brooks was there in Latin class. Barry Holtz was an old friend. Arnie Cover was a friend of Barry's who had also been my camper when he was 12 years old. Um, 
Uh, Michael Brooks had this friend Stephen Zweibam, who he'd been to Is- who he'd been to Israel with, who was at a senior at Colby. Uh, Jim Kugel wrote to us. Joe Reamer discovered us. Um, I'm trying to think. There, there, there are six or seven more people I'm not thinking of right now. A couple of people contacted us, and we said no. He's really in it for the deferments, and we said no to them. There was a fellow named. How would you know? I mean, how would you know? What you they, could just you tell. You, oh, we interviewed, you of interviewed, course, no. of course. I interviewed, and once there were a couple of people who were confirmed members of this. They interviewed with me. So Joe, uh, you have to ask them again, but I think Joe or Michael, I think, or Barry would have been interviewing others already for that first group. And when we sensed that it was really about the deferment and nothing much else, there was a guy named Steve Cohen who reintroduced himself to me many years later in Washington. I know he's the fourth or fifth Steve Cohen, you know, me too. Uh, he's a scientist in Washington. He said, I, I interviewed and was rejected by Chavarat Shalom, or I left Chavarat Shalom immediately, we could tell. It wasn't the right shit. There were a few other people like that. There were a couple of wonderful people whom we accepted and then dropped out. Jim Sleeper, a later well-known sort of social critic at Yale. Danny Pekarski, a well-known educator. Um, too many personal complications for both of them. Danny Pekarski was the son of Maurice Pekarski, had lost his father, a great Jewish educator, and could not handle the Jewish intensity. For Jim Sleeper, I think we were too narrowly Jewish, and he was really more on the revolutionary side and less on the Jewish side, and he dropped out very quickly. Um, but we began putting together a pretty remarkable group of people. Sounds like it was, it was through networks. Personal networks, networks, yes, personal networks. At least. I think we advertised in one or two places. I don't remember, maybe in a student Jewish newspaper or something. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Was, were there any uh, written documents, prospectus? Oh yes, I have them. I have some upstairs and some more in the, in the Chavarat Shalom files. Yes, there's a whole series of documents. I have a document where I say to the prospective Chavirim, Kathy and I are getting married on May 18th. Will you all come to our Ufruf at the Tremont Street Shul the week before? And I uh, just, redis- just rediscovered that and, and various other kinds of things. Yes, sort of draft, draft documents and sending out several drafts. Once the other people were, I was very self-conscious about being the founder. And is this my thing? Is this our thing? How do I make it our thing and not my thing? My ambivalence about leadership began very early. And so I tried to get other people involved in the process. And so sending out drafts to people and asking them to comment and so on. I have several of those early versions in my and files. That was all happening in that first that it was all happening well. between, let's say, March and September of '68. Yes, we. And be- September is when we actually doors began. Opened. Yes, yeah. we so opened our doors in September. I, yeah. I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the recruitment of faculty and what your thinking was about who, who were the teachers that you yes. were recruiting for this. Yes. Yes. Well, we knew immediately that it was going to be a different kind of learning than you did in graduate school. It was going to be serious. Graduate or rabbinical school. Or rabbinical school. It was going to be serious, but it was also going to be personal and engaging. That was the point. That your relationship to the text was important and could be talked about honestly and openly. Even your unhappiness with the text. But you were going to learn to read the text in the original. And you were going to read the, going to read the text well and critically. But you were also going to be, this was going to be a personal engagement. Now, was Glotzer's influence, the memory of Rosenzweig's Lairhouse in the background? Very possibly. A few years ago, I called my old friend Max Tichten, Oliver Shalom, and I asked, who was the first person to use that word Lairhouse in the Hill world for an, for an alternative Jewish course of study? We didn't know if it originated at Brandeis, which would be very interesting because of Glotzer, or if it originated with Bakarsky in Chicago or with Ben at Harvard. But we were several campuses were talking about the Lair House of Jewish Studies at Hillel, and that meant Lair House meant intense study, but more personal, spiritual seeking, theologically open kind of study. The kinds of questions you didn't ask in university classroom, and you didn't even ask in the JTS classroom about what this means to me and what the implications of this might be for a contemporary Judaism. And the creation of a contemporary Judaism was on our minds. Let me go back a little bit to Heschel. When I was a rabbinical student, one of Heschel's former students, Richard Rubenstein, 
published a book called After Auschwitz. It was a devastating critique of theology, saying openly, after Auschwitz, we can no longer believe in the God of history. The God of history is dead. God is dead theology, what's called radical theology, was being talked about in Protestant circles in the late 1960s. And Richard Rubenstein was the spokesman for Jewish, quote, death of God theology. You asked Heschel what he thought about it? You may not mention Richard Rubenstein's name in my presence. Who Talmid Shesarach. He's a disciple of mine who went bad. He said, God is dead. That is blasphemy. You may not mention his name in my presence. End of conversation with Heschel and Rubenstein. Now, Heschel was a Holocaust survivor, for God's sake. His mother and two sisters died in the Warsaw Ghetto. He spent the last years of his life tormented about the Kotzke Rebbe, and the Kotzke Rebbe was his way of dealing with the Holocaust. But to say out loud, God is dead, that's blasphemy. But we had all read Richard Rubenstein. Oh, uh, Joe Reamer was very excited about Rubenstein, and Eddie Feld was excited about Rubenstein. So he, he dared to say the taboo things. So at Chav Shalom, you could say the taboo things. It would be all right to say the taboo things and to raise the tough theological questions that even Heschel wouldn't let you raise. Uh, so it was going to be a new kind of Jewish learning, deep, engaged, textual, but also, but also humanizing. Um, oh, I, I, at some point in this process, began talking about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, and the university has gone too far into the tree of knowledge and has abandoned the tree of life. And we have to recorrect, reconnect the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. I had all kinds of fancy poetic metaphors for it, but it meant a new kind of learning and a new kind of spiritually vibrant learning. And I knew who could teach that way. Michael Fishbane, my dear friend Buzzy, fellow graduate student, could teach Bible that way. He was that kind of person. And Everett Gendler, who'd been a mentor of mine years earlier, uh, when we both we were rabbis at USY encampments back in the 19, early 60s, er, Everett had just come back from a couple of years in Mexico and had settled at a place called Packard Mance, a Quaker retreat house outside Boston, and he heard about this Chavorah idea and was thrilled with it and volunteered to teach in it. And Joe Lukinski was a very progressive educator at KI, also a little different type spiritually, not so much neo-Hasidic, but, but definitely uh, ethically very aware and ethically very open and, and, and cared about the tough issues. He could teach in it. So it was clear I was going to recruit them pretty carefully. Um, there were a couple of guys who had graduated seminary a year after we graduated. I graduated in 67. They were just graduating seminary. One was Eddie Feld, Edward Feld. He came and joined us. Another was David Goodblatt, a Talmudist. They were two of my good friends at JTS. Yet another, maybe the following year, I'm not sure, was Hillel Levine. These were all people who graduated JTS and shared my values and were all people who were interested in doing this kind of teaching. So it was very much my own personal networks that created the original teaching group at Havarat Shalom. And of course we insisted we were an egalitarian community. Egalitarian did not mean anything about gender in those days. Egalitarian meant teachers and students were all equals. We would not take money for teaching because money corrupts, salaries corrupt. And so everybody who was going to be a member of Havarat Shalom would put in $500 a year to support the Havarat. And didn't make any difference if you were a student or teacher, you put in the same 500. So Buzzy had to put it in, and I had to put it in, and, and, and Joe Reamer had to put it in. That's how the community, that's how the original community had, community had its original budget. Everett, he was a teaching member. Did he also put in 500? Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but they were, but we were all, we were all equals. Now that was important because the question came up, well, does a teacher have any kind of authority? Um, can a teacher give you an assignment which he expects you to do and you have to do it if you're all equals? So there was a confrontation between Buzzy and Steve Zweibam. Steve Zweibam was one of the more counterculture types in our group. He said, I like to groove on teachings when I lie on the floor with my eyes closed. It drove Buzzy crazy. Buzzy was a, a very disciplined academic and could Steve be in his class lying on the floor with his eyes closed while Buzzy taught? And we, I think in the end we said yes, we couldn't say no to Steve because that was his style of learning. But Buzzy was, I remember, offended by it or put out by it because was this really going to be serious if you could do that instead of taking notes? 
lie on the floor with your eyes closed. I remember that discussion about the nature of student-teacher relations. But um, so it was a network of an extended network of friends. Barry and Barry was also married that year, married the same year to Janet. You've probably heard about Janet. She was very close to Kathy. Um, and Janet was also a very seriously spiritual person and good Hebrew background and so on, Hebrew Teachers College, and was interested in learning. She was one of the few women who really came in as a member of the Chavura. Barry and Janet both came in as members. Kathy and I both considered ourselves members, though I don't think we paid double. I think we paid the same for a family membership as an individual right. membership. But Janet and Kathy were both learners in the Chavura, wanted to learn and from be... The from the beginning, fully part of it. There was also another woman who came singly in that initial group, whose name was Debbie Wolin. Debbie Wolin came in as the only single woman in the original group. Um, she dropped out after a year or two, then became a Christian scientist, died very young, but she was a part of the group. Um, the others, people like Gail and, uh, and Bella Saverin, came in more or less as girlfriends and then wives of people who were involved. They became socially involved in the group, but were not initially conceived of as full, as full members of the Chavra. So it was mostly men, but not completely. Uh, Janet and Kathy certainly were, were, were completely taken as members of the group. So um, I want to just sort of delve into some of the aspects of the, the, the life within the community as it sort of, of course. got going. Um, but before that, I, I wanted to ask you, do you have um, a mem memories of the very, very beginning? What were the very first things that happened when the, the doors opened on Franklin Street, right, in Cambridge? I'm sorry, I have no such memories now. No memories of the first meeting, the first meal, the first... Event. I remember renting the house, mm -hmm. and... It was a duplex, and Kathy and I lived on one side of the duplex, and we paid that rent. And on the other side of the duplex, the Chavura rooms were downstairs, were the first floor. And upstairs, there were three bedrooms, and three single guys paid rent for those bedrooms, and that's how the Chavura supported its side of the rent for the duplex. The duplex, the doors between the two sides of the duplex were usually open, and Kathy remembers going into our bedroom and finding a meeting going on in our bedroom without anybody having told her and things like that. It was all very, very communal living. And Kathy and I were sort of at the center of that. And the three guys living upstairs were Steve Zweibaum, Arnie Cover, and I don't remember who else. Um, and, uh, and other people all lived in the area nearby in Cambridge. From the beginning, the idea was you had to live within walking distance of the Chavura. It was not so much about not driving on Shabbat, it was because your home had to be open to other members of the Chavura. People had to be able to drop in on one another. I think we, most of us had been in Israel for a year. Excuse me, many of us had been in Israel for a year. And we were very impressed with Jerusalem's Shabbat culture, where people just dropped in on each other. Now, in those days, not many people had private phones in Israel. You didn't phone in advance. You just, Shabbos afternoon, Jerusalem was divided between the visited and the visitors. And you just sort of walk into people and they would expect you. And we loved that. And the, that, that ideal was you could walk into one another's homes. You could feel yourself always welcome in each other's homes. That was very important. So that we lived within a, a radius nearby was very important to us. He asked me about an initial event at Havarat Shalom. Yeah, if, there, if there were anything that you remember. I do not remember an initial yeah. event. I do have a memory of our first retreat, our first Shabbat retreat. And the memory there is that we had given out assignments. Somebody was leading davening and somebody was making Kiddush and somebody was, was, was leading some kind of bracha after the meal and Debbie Wolin was in charge of Kiddush. And Debbie Wolin had no idea what Kiddush was. You could stand Kiddush on its head, she wouldn't know it from anything. She gets up and for Kiddush, she reads a little poem she had written for the occasion. Something about, I am an egg, I am a potato, I remember. And she sits down, and that was Kiddush. And she held up the glass while doing it, and that was Kiddush. And Joe Lukinski was there. He didn't usually come to Chavara events, but he came. He had come to that one. It was, the, I think, the very first retreat. 
And he gets up and says, does anybody mind if I make Kiddush for my family? And we were very relieved because we couldn't do it because that would be non-equal somehow. We would be telling Debbie that her egg and potato poem was not a legitimate form of Kiddush. But Joe, who was sort of on the border, he was a, half a guest. He was teaching, but he was not really a member of the Chavura. He wasn't part of this egalitarian ethos. He could sort of, from the side, say, I want to make Kiddush for my family. And people like Barry Holtz and myself and Joe and others were very relieved that somebody was really going to make Kiddush. And that was a moment in sort of the liturgical history of the Chavura, where we realized that we didn't want to do anything goes. It was one of several such moments. But I remember it as the very first retreat. So we'll come back to that. Sure. Um, I want to sort of just sort of dive in a little bit more into the sort of the, the ethos of community um, as you were envisioning it at the moment. And um, I just wanted to ask you to des- describe what the, the Chavara's ideal notion of community was as you were starting at that point. I don't think I can articulate it now, and I don't think we had quite articulated it then. Uh, Was there we would use terms like, mm-hmm. we will all be there for each other. We will all be fully present to one another as human beings. I think we would have said we will all love each other. Um, and that meant somehow values like openness and generosity and caring for each other and listening to one another, deep listening to one another would have been talked about. Um, Sharing values. There was talk about does community happen because you're committed to community or because you do things together and that makes for community. And the answer was both. So it was both self-articulated, you know, we are creating communities, but it was also we have this shared project of the renewal of Judaism and that is what we, that, that's what binds us as a community. Mm-hmm. Um, there was too much talk in the first couple of years about what do we mean about community? What is the nature of community? And eventually we used to parody ourselves and laugh at, oh, another Chavra meeting about the nature of community? And you will see in the second year we began to have difficulties around that. There were many programs, projects, let's talk about the nature of community and we beat it to death. But I don't know if we had a good definition at the very beginning. I read in um, a paper by Meredith Wucher. Are you familiar with her paper on the, the sort of, I think the ideological beginnings uh, context in which the first three Chavarot arose? Um, it was written at Brandeis. I, uh, no, I didn't know about that. I know that Jonathan, I spoke to Jonathan Sarna about, don't you have a graduate student who would like to do a history of Chavarat Shalom? And he wanted Meredith Wucher to do it. And I don't think she ever contacted me. And so I didn't know she actually ever, ever did anything about it's a it. It's paper. It's not, it doesn't look right. like a graduate thesis. It's not yeah. long enough. It's maybe 100 pages or 660 to 100 pages, something it's like that. Good-sized but paper. in that, um, she mentioned a Chavarat Shalom covenant. Yes, there was a covenant. Can you talk about that? It sounds to me like it might have been, in some sense, inspired by the 18th century. Uh, yes, it probably uh, was, uh, but I'm sorry, my memory is not good enough. Okay. Was that a Lechatchila covenant? Is it something we set out to do at the very beginning? Or was that an attempt to resolve some early conflict? So I don't think so. Early. I think it was, so early. it was early. I think it was quite early. And early I s- and that it was an articulation of Yes, I just discovered it upstairs. I have it upstairs. Ah, and uh, I was showing it to my student, Ariel, just a, couple, a month or so ago, we were going through that file. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, here's the covenant. Mm-hmm. Um, just to jog your memory, what she says about it is that it was not something that anybody needed to sign on to. It was an expression of ideals. And the idea was for people to post it in their homes or where they would be able to see it, uh, but it was a sort of vol- nature of a voluntary commitment, but it was a, a statement of what the ideals of the community were. Sounds right. Sounds, Sounds right. like that would have fit us. We wouldn't have forced anybody to sign anything, but the voluntary, everything, voluntary, consensual was the way we operated. Right. I wanted to ask you to 
talk a little bit about the kinds of ways that the community came together on a regular basis as part of the creation of community. So you've you've mentioned several things, but over the course of our conversation already, but um, in terms of sort of traditional and ritual uh, ways in which the community came together regularly, Shabbat, Chagim, other kinds of things like that, can you sort of Talk yes, yeah. the events, uh, uh, the typical events were number one classes, as I said, to be full time involved in the Chavra, I think you had to be taking three classes. And those <coughs> classes would meet at various times during the week. So you came for your class. You came for a communal meal once a week. That was usually on a weeknight, not on a, not on a Shabbat. Um, and there was also a community meeting, more or less weekly. Sometimes the meeting would follow the communal meal, but not necessarily. They could be a, a single extended event, or they could be separate events. Um, those were the during the week commitments. You also came because you might have a job. There was a roster of jobs, cleaning the house and mowing the lawn and things like that, taking care of the chavura place. So you might have to come because you had some kind of setup job or cleanup job. And how were those assigned? some kind of rust, rotation roster, but I don't remember the details. Um, and on Shabbat, we had a Kabbalah Shabbat service, which was very important. It was more or less assumed that everybody who was in town would show up for Kabbalah Shabbat. And that Kabbalah Shabbat service was closed. It was open only to members of the Chavra. And then we had a Shabbat morning service that was open to the public. That was our public event. When people wanted to come feel like a part of Chavarat Shalom, or learn from Chavarat Shalom, or be with Chavarat Shalom, they came to the Shabbat morning service. Um, the Did you have regulars, I assume? Yes, we had regulars. Mm -hmm. We had regulars. Uh, some of them local people, some of them tough students. Mm -hmm. uh, probably some Harvard students came up. I mean, I'm talking about in Somerville. And, and Somerville was it's closer to Tufts than to Harvard. Um, so that was starting the second year? Yes. Two young women who were tough students became very close to us. One was Ruthie Pinkinson, uh, now a well-known Jewish educator, early childhood person. The other was Louis Elfand, later Louis Asher, two women from Philadelphia, uh, both Akiva graduates. And uh, there were others who were, who were regulars. Uh, Friday night, we wanted to keep closed because we wanted some a more intimate fila setting for the Chavra. That was discussed. Some people were offended by the idea that we didn't welcome anybody to come Friday night. Some we, people on the outside or the inside? Some people on the outside and probably some on the inside too thought we should open it up. Uh, but we didn't originally. Uh, we did not have a communal meal Friday night because we wanted to have people invited to one another's homes. The idea was that nobody in the Chavra should be left alone Friday night, but there'd be a group at the Brooks's house and a group at the Green's house and a group at somebody else's house, and that was sort of the way we did Friday night. Sometimes we'd have a retreat, either in-town retreat or out-of-town retreat, and then that was Friday night together, and Sudash the Sheet together, and so on. But, but basically, uh, basically, it was a Friday night Kabbalat Shabbat before dinner, and then, um, and then the Shabbat morning service were two major Shabbat events. Right. The Chabra is often referred to as a, as a Shabbat inviting community. Um, um, you, you and Kathy were regular inviters. Yes. Clearly, everybody mentions that. Um, did there tend to be some people who were the inviters and some people who were the invitees? How did that? How did that work? You mentioned three I couples think to start the with. couples. The couples were the inviters, generally speaking. Um, there were more domestic types somehow. Uh, and since I'm a cook, I immediately want to say it wasn't because just the women did the cooking. Uh, um, but Kathy and I, Kathy, let me go back to tell you a little bit of Kathy's story. And that is, Kathy was an undergraduate at Northwestern in the mid-1960s. She came to Northwestern her sophomore year, and she rather immediately went to National Hill Institute. At National Hill Institute, she met the Tictons, and Zalman and Dick and Sherry Israel became a sort of very close to them. Kathy was an orphan, but she'd lost both her parents in adolescence, so she was pretty much alone in the world. And I think the Tiktons and Zalman all discovered that, and Kathy became a bat bayit in two homes. Uh, 
in, in Chicago. One was Max Nestor Tickton's home, and one was when Zalman talked about Sister Dvera along with Sister Crandall. Sister Dvera turned out to be Zalman's sister. Oh. Zalman's <laughs> sister Dvera, who sort of modern Orthodox, Hasidic style, and big Shabbos table always. And the Shabbos table of the Kiefer's home, of Dora and Kiefer's home, and the Shabbos table of the Tickton's home really became models for Kathy, I think, and for Kathy and me. And the idea of uh, somehow the Shabbos table is very much a center, a central part of our marriage. And the idea of having Shabbos and inviting people on Shabbos, and that's, that was the image of the home we wanted from the very beginning. And so I think we conveyed that, for example, to Michael and Ruthie. And with Michael and Ruthie Brooks, that got conveyed to, to people like Joe and Gail and people like Barry and Janet and people like um, Larry and Debbie Fine, and George and Bella Saverin, we sort of became the couples, whether formally married or but the couples living together, who had Shabbos homes and Shabbos tables and wanted to invite people. The single guys tended to be the invitees. Uh, Steve Zweibaum or, uh, or, or an Arnie Cover, who were, who were there as singles, what were these guys going to do for Shabbos? Somebody was going to invite them for Shabbos. So I would say that was the pattern, that the couples invited the singles. So can you describe what uh, Shabbat dinner, our Shabbat dinner was like as you hosted it, as you and Kathy hosted it? No, I can't. I mean, it was like Shabbat dinner. Uh, well, you, you just talked about the model that Kathy uh, was emulating that she eats. So what was that model? I mean, what did it consist of? Besides wonderful food, I assume. A lot of warmth and a lot of good food and singing. Singing was definitely part of it. Even though neither Kathy nor I can carry a tune, singing was definitely part of it. So singing Shalom Aleichem and singing Zmiris. And uh, in those days, did a, one of us, did I teach at the table? Sometimes. These days I never do that. Uh, but, but in those days, I think probably there was some teaching at the table maybe before Birgat Amazon. And it was just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of warm and good times together. Somebody uh, described, does this ring right for you? Um, like a, a period of, of silence, almost a med- meditation period. Sort of. we, we, were, we were discovering silence in those days and liked silence. Uh, sometimes you had a silent meal. Sometimes you do Sudash Lishit as a silent meal. Sudash Lishit would take place at the Kavarat? Sometimes, not formally, not always, but yes, sometimes we did that as a silent meal. Um, I have to mention that during that first year of Chavarat Shalom, Zalman was with us for the year. Zalman had a sabbatical from his teaching in Manitoba in 1968, 69. And he came that summer, I think he came for our wedding and stayed, maybe he came for our wedding in May and stayed. Moved in around the corner from us on, on Broadway in Somerville with Malka. Um, he just got married to his second wife. Uh, they came along on our honeymoon, I remember. And I know that because their son Gamliel was conceived on our honeymoon. And, uh, and, um, and uh, Zalman was very important. Well, Zalman, you have to understand, Zalman's interest in monastic spirituality was probably because this was what I call Zalman's Catholic period. He was going to a lot of monasteries and convents. Literally. Uh, yes, yes. And Sister Miriam at Regina Laudis and Brother So and So. He was calling everybody in, who was interested in B'nai or brother and sister. He learned that from the Catholics, of course. Zalman in those days was signing. His, <laughs> I, I joked was, what have I learned from Zal? What did Zalman learn from me? I learned so much from him. What did Zalman learn from me? So the way. Jesuits signed their name, you know, Robert McNamara, S.J., and O.B.M., and so on, the Benedictines. He was signing his name, Zalman Schachter, B.O. And I said to Zalman, maybe you better make it B.N.O. and not B.O. Um, uh, so Zalman Schachter, B.N.A. Or. So it was, so he, silence was something he was learning from the Catholics, I think, or we were learning from Eastern spirituality and Catholic spirituality. So Michael Brooks loved long pregnant silences. He would, in the middle of Kiddush, stop before Be'ava and look around for two minutes before he went on, and you know, like that. That was sort of part of the, part of the drama of the, of the, of the, 
of the spiritual revival we were creating. Yes, in our service too. Both nigunim and silence were very important. It was a way of involving people who didn't know anything. If you had a Shabbat morning service, people came in who barely could read Hebrew, that you could sing a wordless nigun for a long time and then have a silent meditation for a long time was a way of bringing people in. And it all seemed more profound than just mumbling the words. And so those were, those were important innovations in our, I would say silence began to become an important part of our spiritual lives. In the second year of Chavarat Shalom, maybe the first year in Somerville, we had a meditation group. There were four of us who meditated every morning. Kathy, Richie Siegel, Janet, and I would meet for meditation in the Chavura prayer room. And that was a very powerful experience for us. What did you know of meditation? Where were you learning or, or hearing about how to, what you were thinking about or not thinking about or what you, you know, were supposed to be doing? We'd already read things about meditation. I had already participated in a very strange Eastern spiritual group called Subud in New York for a while, which wasn't quite meditation, but something like it. And uh, it was in the air, it was in the culture already. Inside Meditation Center, going in Cambridge. Was it going already? I'm not sure. I but so. I think Jack Cornford's first books were coming out then. He's the guy from there. Um, and... Uh, so the meditation was in the air, so to speak, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that was very important. So yes, silence, silence, pregnant silences were there. Some people love them. Steve Zweibaum and I love to share silences together. And then I remember other people like Arnie Cover and Michael Strassfeld, who came later, uh, they called themselves, quote, the sons of Lithuania means they were the Neo-Litvaks who didn't like all this Neo-Hasidic spiritual intensity. And they were very uncomfortable with these silences. Um, but I would say a sort of a sort of quiet, quiet, often silent, but passionate spirituality was in the air. And that was felt around the table on Shabbat. It was felt in singing Yedid Nefesh, which was somewhat new in those days. Um, uh, the language of Shir Hashirim of the Song of Songs was somehow was somehow important. There was a kind of there was a kind of broadly conceived eros about this whole about this whole spiritual intensity that was very much there, and that we were learning hard not to be afraid of. It wasn't always easy to learn that. Some people were more comfortable with it. Some people weren't. Yeah. Uh, Zalman was very important in that. Zalman legitimized hugging each other. That you could hug, that you didn't have to do a sort of 1950s male style handshake relationship, but that you could hug. Zalman was, Zalman was safely heterosexual enough and so on, I think, that, that the, the, ethos of, the ethos of hugging and, um, and of, uh, of a sort of spiritual intensity that went with it mm-hmm. was very much there in the early Chavura, in the early Chavura. Um, I remember during that second year, no, I think even in the first year of Chavura Shalom, we had a visit from a young Orthodox rabbi in New York whom Joey Reamer knew, named Steve Riskin, mm-hmm. now Shlomo Riskin. Steve Riskin came up and spent a Shabbos with us. And he was uh, very impressed with the Jewish seriousness of the group and very uncomfortable about a certain style of spiritual intensity that he just couldn't take. And that was about some of that, that he just, he didn't know what, he didn't know what to do with all that spiritual intensity. I wrote him a letter after that visit, a letter to an Orthodox friend, I called it, and I published it actually in Hebrew, and the Hebrew version of it came out in a journal in Israel very early, and I just rediscovered the English version, and my student, Ariel, wants to give a lecture about that English version. He might do that one of these days. Since we're talking about um, services and liturgy, I want to sort of dig into that a little bit more. And I wanted to, as you're talking about this, thinking about the ways in which you may have brought um, your own ideas and experiences about the Jewish mystical tradition very consciously into 
services um, and the spiritual experience you're trying to encourage and create at Chabarat Shalom? Yes and no. That is, you didn't need the Jewish mystical tradition to find spiritual intensity. Spiritual intensity was what was our bread and butter. It was in the air. Um, part of the 60s character of this was a quest for spiritual intensity. Now, some of that, we haven't talked about psychedelics or grass at all. That has to come along in the conversation somewhere. It didn't come here. I mean, uh, because I think that I think that the openness to that kind of more intense spiritual experience partly happened either because some of us had had such experiences or because the culture was suffused with that experience and everybody knew about spiritual intensity partly through the psychedelic culture. Can you talk I'll, about I'll, I'll, let, let me, let me, let me get there, yeah. Okay, sure. um, and I think we were just also young people in search of some kind of new intensity, new passionate intensity. And the passionate intensity was certainly about building a better world and about stopping the war. But it was also about how people saw one another in a true way. And that meant looking deeply into each other and getting to know each other. And that meant that included being silent together and not filling up the world, the empty space with a wall of words, as we would say. Um, and, so, and so that intensity that we experienced in niggin singing together and in being silent in the prayer room together and in being silent around the table together was all prior to whatever specific content from the Jewish mystical tradition might come into it. It was that was part of that was part of the culture, the broader culture, but our particular communal culture on its own. And then when I began teaching very uh, very intense sounding kavanot or directions for prayer from the Hasidic sources, Barry Holtz and I translated a bunch of those for our book, Your Word is Fire. We did it in the summer of sixty nine, the summer after the second year of the summer after the first year of the Chavura, Barry and Janet and Kathy and I rented a little house in Penobscot Bay up in Maine, and we translated these Hasidic Kavanot on prayer um, that I had learned from Heschel originally. And then that became part of the language of prayer, and it was all about spiritual intensity. Um, that became part of our, part of our rubric but it was Hasidism combined with Heschel, combined with Buber, combined with just the sort of cultural quest for intensity in our, in our age, in our generation. And you could invoke that by an Emily Dickinson poem too, and then you would be silent afterwards and think about that poem. Or by, uh, or by playing a cut from a Doors record and then sitting in silence after that. Those were all the same. They were not quite exactly the same. They were culturally different, obviously, but they all led to that same place of, of inner spirituality and communion with one another across the silence, or through the silence. And they all had a place. And they all had a place. With and they all somehow fit together. And we were, we were creating a Judaism in which there would be room for all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So you've mentioned psychedelics and drugs several times. Can you move your chair over this way? So this kind of Yes, so psychedelics. Um, I had had my first acid experience in the summer of 1965, I believe. Yes, summer of 1965. Zalman had had acid a couple of years before that, I think 63. Uh, Zalman had learned about it, and uh, he had met Timothy Leary, and Timothy Leary took him on his first trip. In 65, I was working at Ramah in the in, uh, in Massachusetts here, what's it called, Ramah, in the, 
Palmer. Ramon Palmer. That was the first summer of Ramon Palmer. And the head of the waterfront mm -hmm. was a dear friend of mine named David Mendelssohn. And David Mendelssohn was a junior at Harvard. And he was taking a psych course with these two cool professors named Alpert and Leary. And they were giving out acid to their students in the course. And he had tried it. So he got some for me. So my first acid trip was at camp that summer on the waterfront of Rama Palmer. You were 15 or so, right? No, 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 no. I was, I was 25 or so. This is not when I was a kid in camp. When I was, ah. this is when I was working in oh, camp. 65, summer of 65, I was a rabbinical student. Yeah. Okay. And David was an under, it was a few years later. He, earlier, he was probably a senior at Harvard, pre-med. And uh, David was, in a, a couple years after that, married to Martha Ecclesburg, um, who is now partnered with Judith Plasco. You probably know them. They probably, they're, they're part of the New York Havara Ezrat Nashim group. Um, but David was a dear friend. He took me on that first acid trip. And it was very important to me. It confirmed a lot of the things I had already seen in the Hasidic sources, sort of a lot of the mystical language took on a new life, took on an immediate, an immediate reality through psychedelic experience. It was almost a translation of the theoretical language in Hasidism to the direct experiential front of, of what happened in an acid trip. So I was very grateful for it. I probably did acid between five and ten times uh, between 65 and 70 or 71. I don't remember when I stopped. At some point, I stopped in the early 70s, but it was in those years, my last years at JTS, the first years of the Havara, I was occasionally doing acid. And it was always in the context of the quest for mystical experience or the quest for some window into a deeper truth. I realized there was great profundity there. Zalman and I were closest in those years because we were two of the very few people who had done both acid and Hasidism. So I would read some Hasidic source and I would send it to Zalman and say, hey, look at this. See, this is obviously describing this part of the experience and so on. We were reading, we were reading the Hasidic sources with an experiential lens that almost nobody else shared. So those were very heady and, and exciting experiences for us. Grass went along with acid. When you didn't feel like engaging as much in an acid trip, you could just get stoned. But it was never very important to me. It became very important to Zalman. Zalman spent the last... 40, 40 years of his life stoned much of the time, and I sort of pulled away from it, but Zalman, Zalman didn't. Um, and uh, in our culture at Chavarat Shalom, not many people tripped. I, w I don't think Joey or Barry ever did acid, as far as I know, or Michael, I don't think so. Steve Zweibam had done a lot of acid, and probably continue to do it occasionally at the Chavura. So it was acceptable, but it certainly wasn't expected. It wasn't the norm by any means. Mm -hmm. And I think there were people who were a little bit nervous that I talked about it so openly. But I did. And, uh, and wrote about it. And wrote about it, yes. Uh, and Kathy had also done acid uh, before that, and so it was important to both of us. And we sort of accepted that neo-mystical post psychedelic culture. Why did you stop? I stopped because I became two or three reasons. I became somewhat disillusioned with it. Solomon was a believer. Solomon said, soon everybody in the world is going to do this and the whole world is going to change. We're all, it's all going to be peace and love. And we have to become we have become licensed LSD practitioners who will lead people in sessions and we will change the world. And this is the age of downing of the age of Aquarius. And I saw people taking acid and going to rock concerts and taking acid and going to dumb movies. And I said, no, you get out of it what you put into it. It's not that the acid changes people's lives, it's that it's who you are. And then we started reading about the Mansons. You remember Manson and people getting stoned and committing murder. And I was sort of horrified by it and realized this was pretty dangerous stuff. And what you really got out of it, if you got something beautiful out of acid, it's because you had something beautiful in your head. So maybe you should concentrate on what's in your head and not what's in the acid. That was one thing. Then it became a little too hard to control sexual energies. 
with on an acid trip, and I came to the edge of getting hurt or hurting somebody, and said, "No, that's not for me." Um, and uh, and it just felt like it was time to graduate from that and go on to go on to so, more serious stuff, more serious spiritually disciplined stuff. And that's when Zalman and I, to some degree, parted company. Zalman and I loved each other throughout our lives, but we parted company in a number of ways. He, he was more a counterculture person later on, and I was more a conventional academic person later on. And he continued to believe in the psychedelic revolution. And I became disillusioned by it and said, no, no, that's not, that's not where the truth lies. Yeah. So within the Chavarat Shalom community in those first years. What role were drugs of any kind, whether it was just passing a joint or... Passing a joint, or passing a joint was taken for granted. If you didn't want to smoke, you didn't smoke. But the, the joints were passed around was, was easy. Um, acid was not casual in the Chavarat. Uh, people knew I had done it. My Itzik Ledger article was out uh, the second or third year of the Chavura. Which didn't response. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so it was talked about with Zalman and me, and we could have conversations about it. And some people, like Steve Zweibam, anybody else besides Steve Zweibam was really an acid head in the Chavura? Nothing I can immediately remember. Danny Matt, but he came later. Uh, he came three years later, maybe. Um, I remember a wonderful, a wonderful evening. We are sitting in the Chavarat Shalom in Cambridge. First, it's got to be first year. And we're sitting there. It's a late Friday night after dinner. A bunch of us are sitting around. And this knock on, there's a knock on the door. I remember Joe Reber was there. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Jim Kugel was there. I don't know who else, but five or six of us are sitting around. And... We open the door, and this young couple, very smashed-looking young couple, come in and say, how do you do? What's your name? He says, I'm Jesus Christ. And she says, I'm Susan. Come in. And say, Jesus, this is Joe, and Jesus, this is Jim, and Susan. And we sit down, and they, and what are they doing there? Well, he's on an acid trip, and they, he decided he wanted to go to synagogue. They went to the Tremont Street Shul. And they told them, no, you're in the wrong place. You go to Chavarat Shalom. <laughs> and <laughs> so we tried to sort of gently guide him through his trip and, you know, not, not, not do any harm and sort of tried to involve him in the conversation in a normal way, the way you do when you meet somebody tripping. And uh, it was sort of <laughs> an evening that stuck in my memory. And then, and then they left. Is it he... Kath, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. We had a little cartoon up on our wall of a teddy bear. Right. And the teddy next to it, it said, sometimes love wears all your fur away. And I somehow am thinking at this moment that that was that Jesus Christ who came back and gave us that as a gift afterwards. But I'm not sure if it was really the same person. <laughs> Um, I, yeah. I didn't, uh, want, want it, it to be one way it is. Could it could be what? Uh, it uh, could only be one way. And not another. Mm hmm Yeah, but I don't know which way that was. Yeah. My my memory of it is that it was uh Miss uh It was Miss uh I don't know. I don't know. 
I don't think we'll get it. That's what happens. Yeah. Sentences just don't get ended. Yeah. Um, go back to services. Yes. Bit, and how the sort of spirit infused it. And I wanted to ask you about the role of um, Torah readings, Divrei Torah, sort of approaches to interpreting uh, Torah, discussing Torah, the parsha, etc., sort of contributed to this whole ambience that you're talking about of creating personal relevance, grappling with issues in ways that were very personal as well as mm -hmm. traditional. The service, as I remember it on Shabbat morning, is that nigun singing and silence and then some davening. There was a time in the early, in the first year or two, when we experimented a lot with what we call creative liturgy. And that meant playing Stravinsky in the background, and it meant, it meant reading poetry. Oh, uh, I thank you, God, for this most amazing day by E.E. E. Cummings. Must have been read a hundred times until we got sick of it, because uh, that was, went with Yotzer Or, went with the miracle of the day. And, uh, and at some point already in the second year, I would say, we began to become more traditional. And we realized we really wanted to daven. I remember Zalman saying to me at some point, they're going to kill davening. And we, Zalman and I both realized that we wanted davening. And most of us in the Chavura wanted some form of davening, davening. But it was relatively brief. And then we, we took out the Torah. We had a very low table, almost like just off the floor like this, in which we read the Torah. Most of us were sitting around in cushions on the floor. And so the Torah was very low. Somebody's parents came. I think Bella Severin's parents came. And were furious. We were reading the Torah on the floor. And that was a chil Hashem. And that was disgusting. And that was insulting the Torah. And that was the, became a big issue. Are we reading the Torah too low on the floor? Putting the Torah virtually on the floor. But that's what we did. We read the Torah. We did not like having a series of aliyot where people went up and back and said the blessing. That took too much time. One, we said the blessing together, or one person said the blessing. Then we read as much of the Torah as we're going to read. I don't know how much of the parsha we read. I do not remember. Somebody else will remember better. And then we had a Torah discussion. Somebody would begin throwing out questions and giving a brief talk, and then there'd be a conversation. The conversation could go, I think, a half an hour, 45 minutes. And that was a very big part of the service. Of the, of the two or two and a quarter hours of the service, the Torah discussion was more than half an hour. And it was very, uh, no holds barred. You could say anything. You could say, I hate this story. That was legitimate to say. Uh, you could talk about why you hated it. And, and, and if you talk too much about this, this reminds me of my relationship with my mother, we would start rolling eyes. I mean, that did happen. There were people who did that, especially, remember, Shabbat morning is open to the public, so it wasn't just us. So sometimes people came and were nudniks in that, in that conversation. As, as participants in the conversation, but not as leaders. Leaders were members. Sometimes the person doing the Dvar Torah would... From the community? I do not remember if we allowed non-members to give a Dvar Torah or not. But I remember there were, there were wonderful things that happened in most of those conversations. There were occasionally nudniki things about the reason I'm uncomfortable with this Parsha is, or this reminds me too much of my mother in my mother's synagogue or something like that, you know. Uh, th those things, those echoes were there in the background sometimes. But um, there was a, what we were talking about in retrospect, there was sort of rebirth of Midrash. It was a lot of Midrashic conversation, especially in Bereshit around family dynamics. Joe Reamer was so good at the psychology of family dynamics and, 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 and Joel, Joel's poetic insights and and there were just very exciting things going on in talking about the stories, a lot of them in interpersonal terms, what this meant, what this meant interpersonally, sometimes spiritually, but I think more, more psychologically, interpersonally. Just very, very rich and heartfelt and open conversations. And a lot of the love in that community, and there was a lot of love in that community, was expressed in those, in those conversations. That was a place, that was one of our vehicles of loving was sharing those conversations. What is your, if you have a, 
if you have a community that's loving and that's not a sexual community, what is the act of love? How do you, how do you share love in such a community? And, and some of it was in silences, in long, impassioned silences, and some of it was in singing the good hymn, and some of it was in conversations like that across the room around the Parsha. That was a way of sharing love also. And those were all very important, and, and, and we, we saw that and felt that and smiled that to one another. We knew that was, we knew that was happening. We knew that we were being a loving community in the way we listened to one another and got excited about what another were saying. That was, that was the Chavra Torah discussion at its best. As I say, there were bad moments too, but, but mostly, mostly it was very exciting and very loving kind of conversation. And an expression of the openness that was at yes. the of the community. Yes, well, it's love and openness go together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, are there any, any uh, different Torah that stand out for you that you sort of particularly remember? No, I'm not nearly that good. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe people with better memories. Yeah, I mean, again, again, try Barry. I always think of him as the as the custodian of Chavara <laughs> memory. Uh, maybe some others do. Um, to what extent would you say that sort of not? But excuse me, I do remember. I do remember. Uh, some of the most exciting Divrei Torah were around the family of Genesis. The family. You know, that's why Joseph acted that way, and that, this was the dynamic going on between the brothers and so on. So I do remember a lot of excitement about the realizing the family pathology that happened from Abraham preferring one son over the other and the pain of that son and that pain being passed on through three generations. I do remember yeah. Torah conversations about that, yeah. and realizing that for the first time in that, in that kind of conversation. What about um, political overtones um, or undertones in, in these conversations and sort of really contemporary issues that were growing out of what was going on in the world around you? Anti-war, struggles with war, that kind of thing. They were certainly there. Um, and we were all very peacenik oriented. We weren't pacifists in any formal or absolute sense, but we were all very anti-war and very pro-peace. And so we were disturbed by, uh, by Parsha B'Shalach, by, by the defeat of the Egyptians and, and the rejoicing at the defeat of the Egyptians in the battle against Amalek. And when you came to those Parshiot in the summer, those Torah portions in the summer, when, the, when you get these awful things about well, we're going to see one tomorrow, aren't we? We are indeed. Uh, we are indeed. But go back, go back and kill the women and children. Uh, you know, we were horrified by some of those things, and we expressed that horror quite openly. And and certainly, we were we were believers in peace and in nonviolent resolution of conflicts. Everett was an influence, and Everett is a pacifist, and. Jim Krogel, as I said, was a draft counselor at Harvard and was considered himself a pacifist in those days or was debating about could he, could he ask for a conscientious objector status in the war. And um, Steph Krieger was very much a sort of political, political leftist slash, slash peace person. And so talk about peaceful resolution and horror at some of the things our ancestors did and felt were, were talked about pretty openly. So I remember that about war and peace. I do not remember how much racial awareness was there in the Chavura or how much or how much the whole issue of Jews and non Jews and Jewish exclusivity. I'm sure that was often felt and talked about, but I can't remember anything specific about it. About the whole sort of Palestinian Jewish relationship in the aftermath of the Six Day War in a very particular period in American Jewish history and its relationship to those issues, which certainly figures in in, in a very important parsha. I just don't remember and don't want to project from later memories onto it. I don't want to make it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so 1969, 
is really the beginning of the settlements. And I was certainly opposed, and I think it's fair to say that the general ethos of the Chavura was we were opposed to the settlements and horrified by, by news of Gush Emunim and, uh, and uh, the, emergence, the emergence of a new right in the Jewish world. But I don't think the Chavura ever took any kind of formal stance on such things. And exactly what the chronology is, when Brera was started and when I started going to Brera meetings and feeling, as I say, partly uncomfortable there, I just don't remember the chronology of that in terms of its relationship to the Chavura. I was just wondering to what extent it came up in, in Torah discussions. I just don't recall. I remember. Yeah. That's significant too. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to just at least touch on the issue of um, awareness of gender, issues around gender. Yeah. In these early, these very early years in the Chavara, uh, you know, your recent, uh, the recent article that was published, I think it's current, the current issue of Pachentrager, there's this uh, little uh, conversation uh, between, it wasn't actually oh, with between, Kinsky, but yes. it was juxtaposed yeah. Yeah, you right. and David Roski, right? right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you mentioned there that uh, this was a, a pre-feminist, pre-women's uh, liberation sort of moment uh, when Chavarat Shalom was being formed, actually. So, uh, and there were a few women who were very much involved in the community and as well as community members who were coming. Do you have any recollection of um, what women were doing uh, in, ter- in terms of any kinds of uh, sort of pushback against sort of gendered uh, behavior in, in public worship and what roles they were playing at all, if any. Was anybody wearing a talus? Was anybody wearing a kippah? Uh, what about the question of being counted in a minion, for instance? Well, I'll tell you, that, that, that one I know. There's, there's a classic Chavara story, okay. and that is in the second year of the Chavara, but I'll, 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 I'll jump back after that. The second year of the Chavara, we are on retreat. And at the end of the retreat, Saturday night, I guess, Epi, Seymour Epstein stands up and says, I have your site on Tuesday and I need a minion. Who can come? And people raise their hands. How many people can come to the minion? And he raises, he starts counting and he counts only the men. And Mona Fishbane, Mona Dekoven, who was maybe married to Buzzy, maybe is just engaged to Buzzy at that point, stands up and says, excuse me, U.S., how many people can come? I'm a person. And we all stopped. And at that moment, we began counting women in the minion. That was the moment when it happened. And it just happened automatically. We all said, of course. And there was no opposition to it. And there was no need to consult halachic precedents or to ask or to ask shailas. It was just, that was obvious to us that she should be counted, the women should be counted. And we immediately became egalitarian instead of counting women at that, at that moment or that Shabbat. Um, it was just so clear to us. That was 69? That was 69, I would say, so, yeah. Six, second year, mm-hmm. yeah, would have been 60, fall 69, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, very, that's a very clear memory. Uh, before that, women were included. I don't, I think it was important to us. I think we were aware that women shouldn't be in a subordinate role of being the cooks and cleaners and that kind of thing. I think, as I say, I was always a cook, and I think I think we sort of modeled that, and I think Barry and Janet were a pretty egalitarian couple from the beginning, and it wasn't like Barry would invite people and Janet would be in the kitchen. It was never like that. Um, and same with Michael and Ruthie. I think the couples were sort of, we were all people who were pretty sensitive to being to being balanced in those things and men taking an active part in household as far as as far as I remember it. Uh, in terms of women taking a role in leading services, I don't think there was a woman who wanted to or felt capable of it. Janet certainly would have been capable of it because her Hebrew was good and she knew all the traditions and so on, but she was a sort of 
Sagat meditation person. She then went off to an ashram in India, you remember, after she left the Chavura. And I don't think that was her style to particularly want to lead, nor was it Kathy's style. Uh, and I don't think there was a woman who really wanted to lead services until Sharon Strasfield joined. Michael and Sharon joined probably year four, of, year three or year four of the Chavura, and then she immediately started leading. Uh, but I just don't think there was a woman in the Chavura who, who thought to do that or wanted to do that. Uh, and women having aliyot, we didn't have a, up and down aliyot like that. So, giving to our tours. Yes, I think I think women gave to our tours very early. As I said when I told you that Debbie Woolen story from the first retreat, mm-hmm. she was to she was to do kiddush. So I think they were given roles equally. And I think maybe things like Kiddush women did. I think I can imagine Janet doing Kiddush. I'm just guessing. That's really a guess, not a memory. Uh, that Janet would have done Kiddush or something like that. Uh, ask others who remember better, I'm sorry. Was, do you recall there being any um, sensitivity around um, issues uh, regarding the gendered language of traditional liturgy? No, that was much later. Much later. That was Chavurat Shalom of a different generation. Right. Uh, that was that was Ariza Arts in the 1980s Chavura with their famous prayer book, train, changing everything into the feminine and so on, which yeah. we of the early Chavura sort of shudder at. Um, no, that was not. Uh, okay. I mean, we were all. Uh, We were already talking mother language. God has mother as well as father. Remember, Kabbalah is the is the format for that, and so and so Shechina the Shechina language, and and I was reading Erich Neumann, the Great Mother, and uh, and so uh, so maternal language as well as paternal, or that the God the Father is really a feminized father figure because he's Ha'av HaRachaman, and the Rachaman is the Rechem, is the womb. That was our language already in the 60s, I think. So a sort of sense of, a sense that there was room for a, for a perspective that went beyond gender, beyond gender definition. I think we were already willing to say, we net, certainly didn't say gender is a construct, that's much later, but the idea that that love transcends gender, and that love is about something, something bigger than that. And the divine love, the love of God, is certainly not to be understood in purely male terms. That that was already our language then. Yeah, okay. but but in a pretty broad, spiritualized sense. So we're back after a. Lovely lunch break. Thank you, Art. Um, and I wanted to turn to the, the topic of social activism uh, within the Havara. And clearly this was a period of tremendous activism on the part of American youth generally, and Jewish youth in particular, um, as we've been discussing. And I wanted to ask you what role um, you saw political and social activism within either the general American context, often the anti-war or the Jewish realms, uh, played within Chavarat Shalom, um, both in terms of a sort of a, a generative principle of what it was about, but also in terms of what, what actually happened on the ground. Mm-hmm. Well, let me say first that the Chavara happened in an era when this was very much daily in the news you kind of have to imagine the things that are daily in the news in our era, I would say the way racial tensions are daily in the news, so the war was daily in the news there. And in 1968 or 69, there were riots in the streets of Cambridge, and, and yes, in 67, 68, because we were in Franklin Street when the, when the streets of Harvard Square blew up. And then, uh, and then uh, Kent State happened in 1970, and we were in Somerville. So this was very much on the daily news, and and we were very upset about it, very concerned about it. As individuals, as citizens, as Americans, this was all very much part of us. Most of us were, were New York Times or Boston Globe readers, and, uh, and if we, were, we were very much aware of what was going on politically and militarily and, 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 and the social fabric of the country being torn apart. 
And while we were all, without exception, strongly anti-war, I think there were some of us who were more or less revolutionary. We even liked, the, most of us liked the word revolutionary, but exactly what did revolution mean? And when we saw the possibilities of anarchy, I think some of us were a little nervous about that, about how much we really supported this revolutionary thing and how, and how much we really meant anarchy. And, uh, and it was not quite as black and white as it might have seemed. There were a few people in the Chavura, Steph Krieger is their main spokesman, who were very political and very concerned that we weren't political enough, were constantly disappointed in the Chavura for not being a more activist organization. Some people were pulled in that direction, but Steph was definitely the most, the strongest, most articulate spokesman of that. I would say Jim Kugel was pulled that way. Um, a few others were pulled that way, and some people uh, Steve Zweibaum and others were sort of totally disinterested in being activists. Um, there was nobody who was sort of right-wing opposed to it, but it was, were you, were you, was that your thing or was that not your thing? It was more, more the way it was talked about. So a, Jan, a Janet Wolf, Janet Holtz would have been disinterested, Steve Zweibaum would have been disinterested. Joe Reamer would have been pulled by, attracted to the, attracted to the Steph Rieger rhetoric, even though probably not willing to go there very much. Um, uh, we use the language of the personal is the political and just being in a community like this is it's in itself a political act because we are transforming our vision of society and that's meant to be a nugget of a new society, the new humanity we're trying to create. But some of the more activist people thought that was a bit of a, a, bit of a cop out because you weren't really changing the society. Then I remember, oh, in year two or year three, we said, all right, we have to do something for needy people. For, and so we started something, a little project for needy teenagers called Brookline Light and Power. Brookline Light and Power was the Chavura's um, youth project. And it was meant to meet near College Corner. And it was for needy youth, kids from the streets, kids from poor homes, not, yes, not particularly Jewish kids, um, or not specifically Jewish kids, but it was about sort of reaching out, reaching out to needy young people. This was going to be our community project, and the activists in our community were all very hot to trot with this idea, and it did not go very well. I think it lasted half a year or so. Uh, I do somehow remember some teenager messing up the place, rolls of toilet paper all over the place, and, and people being very unhappy about how do you handle that. I don't remember the details. Again, somebody else will remember better, but I remember that Brookline Latin Power was something of a colossal failure, and there were a lot of recriminations within the group about should we have done that differently, should we have done it better, was that the right kind of project to undertake? But that was our big communal attempt at sort of doing an activist thing. Otherwise, it was more or less do it on your own and invite other people to come. There's a demonstration. Steph is telling us about a demonstration. Whoever wants to go, anybody's welcome. I don't think the Chavura was, as a group, taking stands on particular political issues. I don't think we were issuing. We didn't like the idea of these Jewish organizations issuing pretentious uh, public statements as though that were as though that had any value. I think that was kind of not our style. Um, people certainly went to demonstrations on various kinds of issues, including anti-war. Many um, people, it sounds like, went to the big march in Washington, for instance, together. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we were also involved in this well-known demonstration against the federations, uh, pressing for more Jewish education. I think that was 1969, and Hillel Levine and Michael Strassfeld and others were very involved in that sort of uh, where is the Jewish charity dollar going and what about education and that was a sort of that was seen by Barry Schrag and others as a kind of po very positive revolutionary step in the history of, of Federation involvement but that's another that's another kind of activism right um, so as you said some members complained about the lack of political awareness and interest did that did it create 
sort of palpable tensions within the group? Do people leave over those issues, for instance? As I said, Jim Steeper left very early, and I think it was that kind of issue. I think he saw that the group was going to become a more Jewish, study, prayer-oriented group than an activist group, and that was not what he wanted. I seem to remember that. Again, you know, ask Barry or somebody who might remember differently. Um, otherwise, I don't remember people leaving over it. I do remember, I do remember tensions over it. Yes, I remember, as I say, Steph being somehow perennially disappointed in the Chavara and expressing that disappointment and causing various degrees of guilt or, 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 or resistance on the part of some other people in the group. So by the second and third year and beyond of Chavara Shalom, the New York Chavara had been founded. That's right. And my understanding, I haven't talked to anybody yet, but my understanding is that that was a much more overtly political uh, well, the way, the way we talked about it in those days was there were three groups. There was Jews for Urban Justice in Washington, there was Boston Chavara Shalom, and there was New York Chavara. The Washington people were the political ones. That was founded by, I, know, I don't remember, Arthur Wasco came in second, but they were, they were very political from the beginning. We were the spiritual Chavara, and the New York called themselves the social ones. They were really interested in creating this group and creating a group feeling and group dynamic, and that was their that was their main thing. And then they became political around Burt Weiss and Murray Pomerantz and draft resistance. They were sort of pulled into the political, but I don't think they started as political. I think they really started as a kind of Jewish countercultural social group. That's my my impression. And I remember we used to use those three designations: the Washington people are political, we're the spiritual, and the New Yorker the social. And social was not a put down word. It was a sort of, that's what they... Yeah. Yeah. So, given the impact of Father Berrigan's uh, comments in Heschel's class, and the impact that had on you, I'm curious why you think political engagement didn't turn out to be uh, a strong focus of your conception of what this organization would be about. Because of who I am, because I was always more interested in the inward than in the than in the political. So fair, fair enough. Yeah, I was never I was never a believer that we were going to do much to change things in the political sphere. Yes, stopping the war was an important goal, and eventually American young people's opposition, I think it's fair to say, did stop the war. So there was an example of political action that, that made a difference. But in terms of changing the society, in terms of changing the way people are, changing the changing the social structure. I never believed much that political action was going to was going to do it. Right. I, I remember I remember saying once that there were really two kinds of Jews in the world: Messianic Jews and non-Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews included the Hebrew Christians, included the Lubavitchers, included included the uh, Gush Emunim people. Um, they were Jews who believed that Messiah is right around the corner if we only do the right things. Zalman was a Messianic Jew in that sense, regarding the age of Aquarius. And I was a non-Messianic Jew, which meant I believed that the wicked kingdom is here for a long time to come, and all we can do is what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai did, create a little corner with their enlightened people and sort of keep a little flame burning during the dark night. And I think I still believe in that, that that's, that's what we can do, pre preserve some bit of humanity and increase some bit of humanity in the world and not really and not really change change the world and bring about the redemption. Israel had just fought and won the Six Day War, as we were talking about earlier, uh, a year before Chavara Shalom was founded. So how would you describe the feeling within the Chavara about Israel and Zionism during these early years? muted. We were very much American Jews and creating an American Jewish project and we knew that. There was certainly no anti-Zionism and I think if you'd asked most of us we would have said of course we're Zionists which meant we supported Israel, which meant we thought Israel was a right project that the Jewish people needed a homeland and, 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 and had done wonderful things and there were some things we were concerned about already, no question about that. The integration of Sephardic and 
and Ashkenazic Jews was not going terribly well. The Israeli Black Panthers were out and things like that. There was concern about the treatment of Arabs already. Even before 1967, the military, military rule uh, and so on, and things like that. The fact that Arabs were not given equal budgets for education and development and things like that. We all, we all knew that and were concerned about it already, even before 67. Um, but that was in the context of generally being very supportive of Israel. But I would say that Havara was very much about being Americans and American Jews. I remember publishing something in a response symposium sometime in the early 1970s, where I said I could, I could live for the next 50 years either on a kibbutz or a mea sharim, and I would always be New York City class of 1965 and Cambridge class of 1968. And that was referring to the, demonst the anti-war demonstrations and what an effect they had on me and how formative the experience of the 60s was in, in my identity. And I think we all sort of saw ourselves as American 60s, because American late 60s people. And many of us had been to Israel, as, as especially, especially those with a stronger Jewish background. Some had, not many had been for a year, I don't think. I'd been for a year already. I don't think many had spent a year in Israel. But, um, but this was clearly an American enterprise, an American Jewish enterprise. And Israel was in some ways marginal to it. In the first Jewish catalog, mm -hmm. Michael Paley wrote an article about Israel, about travel to Israel, I think. And it was a terribly embarrassing article because mostly about how you could get people to pay for your trip to Israel and get there free and, and sort of uh, take, adva take advantage of it. And we all thought that was childish and annoying. And I think Michael was probably embarrassed about it for many years since. Uh, but... Um, but Israel was not strongly on the horizon. And yet, a group left Chabra Shalom, if I understand correctly, and went to become among the founding members of Gezer, Kibbutz Gezer, um, early on in the life of Chabra Shalom. Uh, do you recall that? I don't remember them as a group that left Chabra Shalom, not at all. Okay. Who was a founder of Gezer? Levi Kelman was a founder of Gezer, but he wasn't in the Chavura. Was Jerry Shostak a founder of Gezer from the Chavura? Maybe Jerry Shostak. Mm -hmm. I remember we had connections to the beginning of Gezer. We knew people there. Mm -hmm. I do not remember who, who particularly from Chavura Shalom was in the first group at Gezer. There were, we were all sort of related circles but I certainly don't remember as a group leaving to found Gezer. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I want to go back now to the, the question of community and... Um... I just uh, Give me another second. Sure. There was something else about... About Israel? About Israel, about... Israel was very much a darling project of the Jewish establishment. And we were worried about that. We were already worried about vicarious Judaism. Judaism was about supporting Israel and saving Soviet Jews. And Judaism wasn't about your own spiritual life and your own Jewish learning and your own developing an identity. And we were sort of pushing back against a Judaism that was a Judaism for others. And I think that's partly why there was a certain resistance to Israel advocacy as what Judaism as what Judaism was supposed to be. Uh, we were kind of we were kind of build a community here, build a real Jewish life here. And yet it was and, complicated, right? The Joe and Gail Reamer left and went to Israel. When they left, uh, the Chavara, the Savrins went to Israel. Mm -hmm. Others had deep connections and spent time in Israel. Um, not Gail and Bella uh -huh. are of the same generation. They're both children of Holocaust survivors and very strongly drawn to Israel probably because of that. They had a very strong Jewish peoplehood identity. 
as coming out coming out of their experience as second generation Holocaust survivors. And I think that's what particularly pulled pulled those two couples there. Yeah. Right, and Joe was speaking about his experience there during uh, 66, 67 in the war. So mm -hmm. that had mm -hmm. been a very formative period in, right. in his own yes. identity also. Sure. So. And then his interest in kibbutz, his study in kibbutz and so exactly. on. Yeah. So yeah. As, a, as a form of people yeah. living and education yeah. within that context. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to go back to some, some of the challenges that were happening um, in those first years of the uh, Chavura and uh, and as part of that conversation, I just wanted to talk about the role of the sort of these communal meetings, how they how they happened, and uh, the kinds of issues that were surfacing that needed to be discussed. This was a very self-reflective community, sounds like, and there was a lot of discussion, as you said, about what kind of a community you intended to be and wanted to be, and how you were going to get there, and were there. Um, as you remembered, were there sort of conflicting visions of what that community would look like? Yes, there was constant discussion of that. I cannot tell you about the conflicting visions from the beginning, except around issues we've already talked about, the activist and the contemplative. Yeah. Um, but I do know that by the second year, there were some tensions within the community about people who did not feel completely accepted, did not feel completely loved by the community. And then they began pushing an agenda of trying to legislate communal intimacy. You have to accept me, you have to listen to me, you have to care about me because I'm a member of your Chavura. And people sort of pushing back on that. The whole question of how voluntary the communal thing was and how obligatory it was was certainly, certainly in the air. And when we all felt that everybody was someone we wanted to get to know and care about, that worked well. And when there were people whom that wasn't true, I think that Debbie Wolven was such a person in the first year, people didn't know what to make of her. And there were members of the Chavra who certainly wanted to avoid too much dealing with her. Um, there we had even in even for the original group, but certainly for the second group, you had to apply to the Chavra and we had interviews. And if in the interviews... And these interviews consisted of people coming and spending time. Yes, you would come, if you came from out of town, you'd come for a couple of days. And if you were in town, you might come back for two or three such conversations. And there were several members of the Chavra who were on your interview committee. I was always one of them. But there were a couple of others too, sort of the Vatikim, the sort of old timers, the Chavara, mm -hmm. one year old, half year old timers, one year old timers. Yeah. But people who were sort of, who were sort of the pillars of the group, Joe, Barry, Michael, were sort of the original pillars of the group. They sort of became the interview committee. And uh, the question is, on what basis did we accept people? How much did it have to do with whether we liked them? Um, and how much did it have to do with whether they were Jewishly serious and and committed to our vision and so on? Oh, I've heard it described as also whether they were, quote, interesting people. Interesting people, yes. So there is a fellow whom I've been in touch with over many, many years who was twice rejected by Chavarat He was... Um, very Jewishly knowledgeable, politically activist, believed in all the right causes, Somewhat more orthodox than any of us were, uh, sort of modern orthodox, modern orthodox lefty type, uh, and a difficult personality, something of a nudnik of a personality. And he was, he applied to the Chavura, and I was, in, I encouraged him, I, I already knew him a little bit and thought he would be a good candidate, and people just didn't like him. And Joe Reamer came up with a formulation, I remember, it will not be fair to him if we accept him nominally and then reject him every day once he's here. Because he'll be in the Chavura and people won't want to be with him. Because he's just a difficult person. And so it's kind, the kinder thing to do is not to accept him. And we sort of bought that and were relieved, but I felt guilty about it. And then the guy applied again the next year, 
and the same kind of thing happened. And uh, he always remembered it, and I always remembered it, and I remained friendly with him for many, many years. Now he's, he's lived in Israel for half a century and, and is not, not well. But, uh, but um, it kind of felt a little bit in retrospect, like, there were, suppose, you talk, suppose this were a fraternity, and then you could talk about a fraternity blackball. Yes, somebody, one of the fraternity brothers doesn't like this person, and then he can't get in. Um, and there was, it felt a little, in retrospect, it felt a little bit like that. And I was a little bit morally nervous about what we were creating. We thought we were creating a sort of meaningful spiritual community, and we were recreating a Jewish fraternity. Um, there was something about that that made, me, that made me nervous. On the other hand, what Joe had said was somehow true, that, that to have people there who weren't likable, and then to, that would make the whole community less close. Because if this unlikable person was hanging around the house all the time, we would avoid the house to avoid having to have conversations with him. And I would say that that was unresolved. But then in the second year, we had one individual and a group of people who really felt marginalized by the group, not well accepted by the group. The individual was David Rutsky's first wife. And... Uh, I'm not remembering her name right now. And the group was a group of people, three people who applied to the Chavara in the, in the second year, the third year, I think the second year. Three people, all of whom had almost no Jewish knowledge, no Jewish background, unlike most of the people in the Chavara who had something. Uh, Joe Reamer had a good Jewish disco education. Uh, Stephen Zwebem had none of that, but his parents were survivors, and he spoke Yiddish natively. And, uh, and uh, Michael Brooks was a rabbi's grandson. And there was some, there was some connection prior to Jewish life. These three guys came in, three couples came in. They were all coupled. Charles Cohn, Steve Jenden, and Jeff Sokol, and their, and their spouses, their wives. They all came in, and they knew virtually nothing. And they were people who especially Jeff Sokol, who really wanted to sort of become from. They wanted to become observant, and they wanted to soak it all in, and they wanted everything. And they didn't understand our degree of ambivalence. They didn't understand why we weren't more observant. If we love Judaism so much, how come we weren't, uh, I don't know, not carrying on Shabbos, whatever it was. That they wanted, the more they learned, the more they wanted to observe. But they didn't know anything. And we felt a little bit cynical about them. This, you know, a little bit, in Hebrew you say chassid shote, sort of a foolish, foolish would-be chassidim who didn't know anything and were trying to be so strict. And there was a real cultural conflict with us and them. They were also, I think, two or, th two or maybe all three of the couples came from California and had been sort of California Hills types. And, uh, and they just weren't our kind of Northeast intellectuals. They were not kind of New England. They were not intellectuals. Charles was, they were smart, but they were not intellectuals. Steve Jenden had been a mailman, I think, or became a mailman afterwards. And, uh, and they lived in a house together. We called it Darton. Darton over there in Yiddish. And Darton meant they were really the other. They were the others. Michael Swirsky, who had graduated the seminary a year after me and had also joined us, another of my seminary friends, became their tutor and often spoke, tried to speak up for them and make their feelings listened to in the group. But they were, they were just, there was a, just a cultural conflict between their style of, of quick give me more information so I can become more of a Balchuva Judaism and our been there, done that, that's not really what I came here to create something different, not to become from. You know, they could have fallen into Esha Torah or something, and they fell into Chavarat Shalom. And, uh, what happened with them eventually? With well, the Jordan group? Charles Cohen, I, uh, when we had our 40th reunion, I think he and his wife, he and his uh, different wives showed up. He's been a scientist living in Vancouver for many years, very little connection to Jewish life. Jeff Sokol, I had no idea, he just dropped off the face of the earth, but about two years ago, Somebody said to me, I have regards to you from Rabitzak Sokol from Lakewood. 
and he and his wife settled in Lakewood, 12 children. Terry, Jeff and Terry became Yitzchak and Tova, so-called, 12 children. And then after having 12 children in Lakewood, he moved to the era at the old city of Jerusalem, became something of a Kabbalist, I understand. So he's gone that way. The other one, Jensen, is still still off the face of the earth. Maybe he's some mailman in California somewhere. So Jordan was these, these basically these three couples. These three couples, yes. Yeah. That was clear what Jordan was. And, uh, and the rest of us felt uncomfortable with them. Well, the more we felt uncomfortable, the more they insisted, what do you mean? This is a chavurah, we're a community. You have, to, you have to live up to our expectations of acceptance of us. And we weren't, we, m many of us were, and I was sort of caught in the middle because I was sort of the elder figure. Uh, we were, it was difficult. It became difficult. And then the more it became difficult, the more we had to talk about what is the nature of community? And then we all got sick of that conversation, what is the nature of community? So I would say in that second year, there were some difficult times. Sounds like this came to a head at the end of the first year um, uh, and with, with some efforts to try and sort of talk it through, resolve it. Yes, there, there were several rounds of that, and my memory will not be good. There are, I know I have papers where each of us had to submit our own vision of community, and then we'd have a seminar meeting and talk about them and, and pick up on different people's visions, but which, when that was, and what was in response to Dork and what was earlier and so on, I can't sort out in my memory anymore. Mm -hmm. But there were several rounds of this conversation. Then at one point, was that in the second year, the third year, we decided the answer to our problems was co-counseling. The Chavra would adopt co-counseling as a way of getting us to listen better to one of those. So each of us had a co-counseling partner and we would have these... Can you say what co-counseling is? Co-counseling, I don't remember. You have a session where you have a partner, you listen to it, you have to look in the person's eyes and one person talks for 15 minutes and the other person talks for 15 minutes and you share everything in your heart in a non-judgmental way. It's an that, effort to get to know someone. An effort to get to know someone. Yes, that's right, yeah. And my co-counseling partner was Debbie Fine, and that was very nice for us. And uh, that's about all I remember about it, but it was a, it was a, it was a thing, it was a fad that Chavra went through in, one, in response to one of these, what is community? How could we become a more intimate community? Again, how could we restore the lost intimacy? There was a sense of loss that we'd had something at the beginning and we'd gotten all screwed up toward the end of the first and during that second year and now we're trying to, how could we recreate the lost innocence of our early community and co-counseling was such an attempt. Uh, when did the idea of the Havarat Shalom community being a permanent community really arise and fade? And what? And fade. It didn't become a permanent community for those of you who were involved in, in the early years, in the sense of you're all living in a, in a house, we all knew, in a neighborhood together forever. We all knew that we were in graduate school and that we weren't making a living. Chavarot Shalom for me was something like a full-time job without salary. Uh, we were living on the margins, Kathy and I. I had a fellowship my first, for my first three years at Brandeis, um, which gave me, I think, a $10,000 a year, $8,000 a year stipend. And I was teaching adult education here and there. And then in the second year, once the idea of Chavara began to catch on in the Jewish community, I was sometimes invited to do shul gigs and give lectures. So uh, maybe I was making $20,000 a year at most, probably much, probably much less than that, $10,000 a year. And we were living on that, and we were dig Kathy had some savings because her parents had died, so we were digging into that to survive. And we knew that couldn't go on. At some point, it would have to end. After five years in the Chavura, I decided I needed a job. And I got this job offer at Penn, and, and then we moved to Philadelphia. And I got Penn, I got Penn mistreat me for a long time. And, uh, and, um, So the idea that we would be a permanent community there in the city was not really an option, but we didn't know exactly when it would end for whom. By the end of the second and third year, some people were splitting off and leaving already, going to do the next thing in their lives. And we took that for granted. Oh, there was a fantasy about a rural community. We'd all move out to the country together and raise vegetables and be, farm, be Jewish farmers. And we heard about these communes in Vermont. And wouldn't we like to do that? 
and maybe we'd be a re- rural community with a retreat house where people would come and spend weekends and send their kids and, and we do programming for them, but we never developed it in any serious way. Janet was part of that conversation, Kathy and I were part of that conversation, I don't remember who else, but it never developed seriously. So I would say that in our five years in the Chavura, there was never serious talk about our being a permanent community. We all kind of knew that this was a certain phase in our lives. Only several years after I left did some people begin making the Chavura their long-term community. Joel Rosenberg was our bridge to those people. He stayed around Chavurah Shalom and around Somerville for a long time, so he got to know the 80s generation of the Chavurah, which was a generation that we didn't know at all. Right. And Joel, and then Eliza Arts really became the person who, who most symbolized the sort of long-term Chavurah of the later years. And there are people in Chavurah Shalom now who have been, who, for whom it's been their community for 20 years. Yes. So it, interestingly, in some sense, it did become a permanent Something community. more like a synagogue, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is ironic in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to look at some of the other challenges. We've talked a bit about the issue of the admissions process and inclusivity and exclusivity. Um, somebody, I think it was Bill Novak, in a response article in those early years, mentioned an issue of what he called religious intimidation. And I'm wondering if that uh, resonates for you at all. I think it, he was referring in some ways to the idea that people who, that, that despite the ideal of egalitarianism and a non-hierarchical structure at every, in every aspect of community life, that in fact there were people who were tremendously knowledgeable at the center with very strong backgrounds, and there were people who had very weak backgrounds or little background at all, and there was some kind of feeling of uh, religious intimidation around what you could do, what you couldn't do, uh, etc. So any thoughts on that? Does that resonate at all for you in terms of the feel of the community and the ethos of the community? Not really. Mm -hmm. I think Bill may have felt that, but I don't think many people did. There weren't a lot of rules about what you could or couldn't do, certainly not in your personal life. Nobody told people you can't eat non-kosher food or you've got you've to gotta do this on Shabbos. I think that we, that we were a community that cared a lot about Shabbos and spending Shabbatot together. Yes, but nobody ever said you can't go to a conference on Shabbos or you can't go to a demonstration on Shabbos or anything like that. There was none of that, none of that kind of thing. Now maybe people felt it from the ethos of the community. I don't know, but... But there were not there were not strong rules. I mean, these were these were nineteen sixties people without a lot of rules. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, some of us had a lot more Jewish knowledge. No question about that. That's myself and Buzzy, and even some of the younger people like Joe and Barry had a lot more Jewish knowledge than somebody like Bill did. Uh, Epi had a lot of Jewish knowledge, but I don't think. I don't recall that people felt intimidated by that. But if Bill says it, then you have to. That was a to long him. time ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Who knows? Um, yeah. I wanted to come back to the question of power and authority in the community yes. in general, which is sort of a related issue. Is something that you clearly struggled with. You called yourself, in some ways, you know, an ambivalent leader, or you had to deal with the sort of this ambiguous position that you were in, given the egalitarian ethos in the community. How do you think? those issues of authority and leadership and power sort of played out in reality. I mean, what, what was it that you were actually having to struggle with and the community was struggling with around those kinds of issues? Everybody knew that I had founded the Havara. There was no secret about that. And when it came to the outside world, I was the spokesman for the Chavara. If somebody wanted to learn about Chavara Shalom, they went to Art Green. If somebody wanted a lecture about the Chavara in their community, they invited Art Green. On the other hand, inside the community, in a community meeting, I did not chair the meetings. I tried not to dominate the meetings. I tried hard to make sure my voice was not heard too loudly above, above others. It was just another voice in the community. But then that was frustrating for me. I was pissed off at what was going on in the community, and yet I had to go out and talk about this ideal 
community we'd created. Uh, so I was in a kind of inner tension. Was I the leader of the community? The community did not want a leader. And I didn't know that I wanted to be leader of the community. I didn't say, yes, I want this and I'm annoyed the community won't accept me as leader. I guess I was ambivalent about that role. Remember I talked about Heschel and Zalman wanted to be my Rebbe's and I wouldn't have a Rebbe, so I didn't want to be the Rebbe either. I didn't want to have one, I didn't want to be one. I don't like strong leaders in that sense. I really like the, the charism being located in the community and in the inner dynamic and not in an individual. Um, I was a reader of Buber's I and that and Buber's ideals of community before Chavarat Shalom. And so the, I, the, 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 the charism is supposed to exist in the realm, what Buber called the realm of the in-between, that which is in the center of the community, that empty space into which we all put our souls. That's where it is. Um, but sometimes you get impatient waiting for that to happen. And especially if there's a whole group over in there over there in the Dorton corner that's just murmuring and unhappy, then that doesn't happen. So then should the leader step in and try to become a leader again? No, I sort of pull myself back from that situation. And then other people feel, well, why don't you do something? This is your thing, why don't you, why don't you assert some leadership? And I think I got mixed messages from the community about how much leadership they wanted me to take. And I myself gave mixed signals about how much leadership I wanted to take. So I would say, from toward the end of the first year onward, that was an ongoing sore point or unresolved point. How For much, you and the community. Yes. How much I was leader and how much leadership I should take. And uh, it didn't, it's not like we were constantly unhappy about that. Most of the time we were quite happy being there, and quite happy with each other. But I would say there were, there were moments when that could bring attention to the fore about the question of what was my role and how much people were to count on me. Well, looking back on it from a vantage point of almost 50 years, was there a way to resolve that actually or was that just inherent in the situation? I think it could have been put on the table more clearly and more forthrightly than it was. I think sometimes it was an unspoken issue. And I think with, with the maturity of being a 75 instead of a 28-year-old, I could probably say, yes, it could, have been, it could have been dealt with more directly and more openly. Uh, yeah. Did that issue of authority sort of pervade other aspects of life in the community? For instance, in the relationship between... Um, both the idealized notion of the relationship between teachers and students or teachers and learners. Um, you know, did teachers have any authority as you were telling that story about, I forget who it was. Yeah, Buzzy and Steve yeah. Zweibel. Um, and, and the role of expertise in general. Yes, expertise was respected. I taught a course on Hasidism in the first year and a course on Rabbi Nachman in the second year. I had a wonderful group of people in each of those classes. And they respected my knowledge and learned a lot from it. And people certainly respected Zalman's knowledge that year when he taught. And Everett, yes, people, and Buzzy, certainly people respected knowledge tremendously. And I think the members of the Chavura recognized they had some exceptional teachers in their midst. I think we who taught felt appreciated by the Chaverim. Um, I think sometimes a teacher would feel disappointment that people didn't do assignments or people didn't, weren't, quote, taking it seriously enough. Um, if you had a graduate exam at Brandeis and you had a Chavara class to prepare for, you did your graduate exam at Brandeis. That's where it counted. It was, and we said, are we like Hebrew school? You know, is this becoming like Hebrew school where there's always something else more important in your life? And we tried to avoid that role in people's lives, but sometimes it felt that way. Um, so I think that uh, how, much, how much time and how much psychological room do people have to take this as seriously as we think it's worth? I think we teachers sometimes, sometimes felt that. We felt we were giving them a great deal and they weren't always, weren't always living up to it. They people in the classes. Uh, 
as the years went on, one thing I'm not clear about, even in these early years, in the first year, or two years, you had recruited people who were there as faculty, who were members, but they were clearly there as faculty. Yes. As time went on, were, were there always faculty, or did members of the Havara increasingly teach the classes? Who taught the classes? As Could anybody teach a class, or were there people who No, were this, was not, this was not anybody could teach a class, no. There was more qualified people, more knowledgeable people throughout the classes, and that's what people wanted. It wasn't a sort of like Chavura Institute where anybody, you know, mm -hmm. anybody with any degree of knowledge can teach a class, and if people sign up, that's great. It was not that model. Um, Were there people who came not as Chavura faculty members, but as Chavura members who wound up teaching? Right. I don't remember. Did Joe ever teach in the Chavura? I don't think so. Did he say it out of the Chavura? Didn't. I don't think so. In our years, Joe Rosenberg didn't teach. Um, maybe Ruskies. I have to ask teach. him. Ruskies might have taught in the Chavura, might have taught Yiddish in the Chavura, for he example. Did. Uh, David Rose, I mean, uh, Joel Rosenberg talked about David yeah. his class. So he would have been one. Um, I can't remember who else. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of as time went on? I mean, even after you left, but in those first five years, and then, but then beyond, what role did classes play in the life of the Havara, or did it become more of a a, a a local synagogue neighborhood show. Well, you it's know, the seminary part was really over after two years. First of all, the draft ended, right. and so draft deferments became irrelevant after the second year. And we realized we were never going to ordain rabbis. And everybody was sort of relieved once we decided that. Um, and. Uh, were you? I wanted learning to be a significant part, and I wanted learning to remain intense. And I think I had to convince myself that it still would. And I taught classes all the way through, all through my five years there that I think were pretty serious and pretty well respected. And uh, and so I felt I felt good about that, but the learning component declined somewhat. I guess what I'm asking, particularly in light of how your own life and career evolved, to what extent you were really uh, devoted to the idea of training and creating a new kind of rabbi. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of creating a new kind of Jewish leader. I didn't know if I wanted to call it rabbi, but a new kind of Jewish leader. We thought maybe we'd ordain people with the title Haver rather than rabbi, because the title of rabbi was so corrupted. Um, and also, we didn't want to train people to paskan halacha, to make halachic decisions and things like that. That wasn't our interest. So, but uh, you know that in the mid-1970s, when I was teaching at Penn, uh, a group of us, Everett and Zalman and uh, Herschel, Matt and Max Tickton and I, tried to create a seminary without walls because we wanted to, we felt something different had to be done in rabbinic training. And then and then my years at IRC, and then here, of course, it's been my whole life. I have three times left the Secure Academy for this for this fly-by-night rabbinical school vision. I ask. Uh, <laughs> Kathy used to say, some guys every few years get a, little red, get a little red sports car, and Green gets a little red rabbinical school every few years. <laughs> to, which I, to which my comment, my, my note is, Red in that sentence refers mostly to the color ink in the ledger book of those rabbinical schools, and a little bit to the students' politics. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's you know, uh, it's but you know, uh, but I obviously it's what I have to do with my life is train rabbis, and I'm very happy with it. I'm very glad I'm doing it. Exactly. But uh, at that point, you were. Ready I don't to know let that I. Yeah, you were ready yeah. To let it I go think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I want to spend sort of the next and the last period of our, our talk this morning and afternoon, uh, just on some sort of larger reflections about the directions your career has taken, but also the, the meaning and impact of the Chavarah. Uh, 
both for you personally, but also for American Jewry and beyond. Um, so you started to mention just a few minutes ago, but I wanted to ask you to talk about um, when and, and why you decided to leave the Chavura. I decided to leave the Chavura partly for practical reasons. I say I needed a job. I realized we could not go on living on the margins that way uh, forever. This was 73? This was 70, 73. 70, yes, I left, I left in the fall of 73, and then I would have to get a job. Uh, Where were you when your graduate? Let me tell you that story, yeah. In the first two years, I completed my coursework in graduate school, and then when I really got involved in the Chavura, which is the, toward the end of the first year, I more or less dropped out of graduate school. I never told Professor Altman I was dropping out. Altman's idea was you want to be a scholar of Jewish mysticism, that means you'll be a medievalist, you learn medieval Latin, medieval Arabic, and you'll do a manuscript. And the whole thing seemed very boring to me in 1968. And I more or less dropped any involvement. I didn't prepare for my exams, I didn't prepare a dissertation topic, I just sort of stood on the side. For three years or so, I was involved in the Chavura. That was what I did, teaching in the Chavura, preparing for teaching, then lecturing about the Chavura and adult ed and so on. I was not doing anything toward that academic career. And I thought maybe I would drop it, that, I, that PhD was just too profane for me, too violating of the stuff I loved. And to write footnotes about mystics was really not what I should be doing with my life. Be a mystic rather than writing footnotes about mystics. And then two things happened. Dick Israel came to me and said, circa 1971, came to me and said, I want to offer you a job. Dick was by then Greater Boston Regional, Regional Hill Director. He said, I want to offer you a job. You'll, I want you to, I'm going to set you up in a storefront, either in Harvard Square or on Mass Ave someplace, a storefront Hillel for all the people who would never walk into Hillel. And you won't have to raise money, and you won't have to run dances and socials and all these things that Hill directors do for Jewish boy meets Jewish girl. You'll have meditation classes, and you'll teach text classes, and you'll have a big Friday night Shabbat dinner for everybody. Everybody, hundreds of people come, sort of like Shlomo Karlbach style. And you, of course, you'll be there all day and talking to people and engaging people. And I thought about it, and I said, and he said, probably it'll open around noon, but maybe you'll be there till nine, ten o'clock at night. And I remember thinking. Noon to 10 o'clock at night is like 9 to 5 only later. And I said, this is the best job offer I'm ever going to get other than being a professor. And I think I don't want it. Because I think I want time for my own learning and my own growth and my own thinking and writing. And then I said, I better go back and finish the doctorate. And then I saw also that some of my, two of my students, Larry Fine and David Ruskies, were getting doctorates already. They were writing dissertations, and if they could do it, I could do it too. So then I went back to Altman, and I said, Professor Altman, I want to write a book on Rabbi Nachman of Wroclaw. Would you accept it as a dissertation? And he said, yes. He was very enthusiastic about it. I still have his letter inside my copy of Nachman's teachings. And, uh, and so I wrote, the book, I wrote what became Tormented Master, Life of Rabbi Nachman, and that became my dissertation. So I was on that path already. And then this job at Penn came up. What happened was Larry Silverstein was teaching at Penn. Larry had been an older fellow student of mine at Brandeis in my undergraduate years. He was teaching at Penn in modern Jewish thought, and he needed somebody in classical Jewish thought. Larry turned to Altman, and Altman recommended me. And that was a very nice compliment by Altman and a very nice job offer. And I went to Penn, and I got a job at Penn. 73. 73. I was there for 11 years. After 11 years at Penn, after 11 years at Penn in 1984, I was earning $27,000 a year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, sounds like you were doing just as well as a grad student <laughs> right. many years earlier. Right. right. Um, so from there you moved several times, as you just said, between so I, went, so I went to Penn. I was at Penn for 11 years. At Penn, I uh, was in the Religious Studies Department. I was the Jewish Judaism person in the Religious Studies Department. Jewish Studies were also taught in what was called um, Semitic Department, or Oriental Studies Department. Uh, 
The Oriental Studies Department never liked the Religious Studies Department very much, and were, the relations were not very good. Um, when I came up for tenure at Penn, after six years or so, two things happened that were interesting. One was my department chair said to me, you know all those articles on your CV about personal search and about Jewish theology today and about faith, better take them off your CV, they don't look good for a professor of religion. In other words, you look they're, that's right, they're too personal, they're not, they're not strictly academic, so take them all off your CV. And I then knew that that was not the place for me. It also happened that Judah Golden, who was the senior scholar in Oriental Studies, refused to support me when I came up for tenure. Um, I had to go to my department chair and say, if you made a list of Judah Golden's pet peeves in life, they would be mysticism, Hasidism, Jewish counterculture, everything I stand for. And I got tenure a year later, but it was just annoying to me. And I was very underpaid and very badly treated. I did not have the, I did not have the good sense or I was too damn proud to go look for other jobs and negotiate and get a raise that way and play the, play the academic game. I never played it. And I felt very, uh, very uh, disheartened by Penn. So then RRC came along. They were looking for a dean. They were looking for somebody to make the place more serious academically and Jewishly. I'd always been interested in rabbinic education. I went and taught a course there, wonderful. Students, enthusiastic, exciting. I took the job there as dean. Two years later, the president suddenly resigned, and I wound up being president of RSC, which was very strange because I'd never been a Reconstructionist. I'd never been associated with Kaplan or the Reconstructionist movement. Everybody knew I was a Heschel student. And I thought that was interesting, possibly a creative moment in American Jewish history, but it never quite happened the way I had hoped it would. Um, I had hoped that my being at RSC would lead to a sort of break up of the conservative movement, that the left wing of the conservative movement might join us instead. It, it, for a whole, this is not our topic. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so I was there for 10 years, and it was time for me to leave. My, my shidduch with Reconstructionists eventually did not work out, I saw, and I wanted to go. And then I got the very great honor of Brandeis offering me what had been Professor Altman's chair, the grand chair at Brandeis. So I came to Brandeis in 94, 93 actually, and uh, and that was at Brandeis until 2003, when I uh, had these two terrific graduate students at Brandeis, Eben Leder and Orr Rose. Um, uh, Orr was my doctoral student, and Eben, whom I'd gotten to know in Israel, who had come here to teach at New Jew, did not have really have a BA or anything, but he was obviously an absolutely brilliant guy. And I talked to Joe Reamer, who was in the faculty at Brandeis, and Joe got Eben into a master's in Jewish education program, the idea being that Joe would teach him education, Joe would others teach him education, and I would continue teaching him Jewish sources. And that was wonderful. And I look at these two guys one day and I say, we have to do something, we have to create something here, I'm not sure what, but you guys are so talented and we work so well together, there's real, real, real warmth between us. And I said, we ought to create something like a Pardes North America, a one-year intensive Jewish living and learning program for people here, emphasizing the strengths of American Jewish life. And we all loved the idea. And what we wanted to do was too Jewish for Brandeis to be comfortable with it. I knew that. So I went to David Gordis. And David Gordis said to me, that's a terrific idea, but we're thinking of opening a rabbinical school. This is David Gordis at, at, at Hebrew College. College. And then I became the founding dean of the rabbinical school, and they were my first two hires. That's how the rabbinical school happened, really. So actually, the rabbinical school wasn't on your mind. Was not on my, was not on my mind. It happened. It was, a, it was handed to me by David Gordis. Uh, it was, it was somehow, yeah. Even though I have lots of complaints about him, he handed me a rabbinical school without any money behind it, without any willingness to raise the money it needed, and we're still suffering from that. But nevertheless, we are here. I'm going to adjust your microphone. Yeah. Cool. So, are there key ideas and? Um, Ingredients that you feel like you've taken with you to uh, RRC, to the rabbinical school here at, at Hebrew College that you first tried to articulate within Chavar Shalom? Yeah, so I want to tell you about a talk of Zalman's. Zalman, just before his death, got an honorary degree from, our, from Hebrew College. Mm 
I guess it was graduation 2014. He came to graduation, after graduation, and that was Kathy's 70th birthday, which is wonderful he was at. And then he came to graduation, spoke at graduation, then he went to, then he went to Isabella Friedman and he died a few weeks later. He was exerted himself too much. Um, it was on the eve of his 90th birthday. And uh, he said, he looked around and he said, this is Chavarot Shalom. this is the continuation of Chavarot Shalom. Everything you're doing here at Hebrew College is continuing the vision of Chavarot Shalom. And he talked about what that vision was and he realized that he articulated it more fully than I had ever quite articulated it to myself. But it was true. And that means the intense quality of learning, but in a setting where personal questions and personal relationship to the tradition and texts are on the table and welcome. The combination between learning and intimate community, and an intimate community especially was built around the chavruta of learning, the, the groups in which we learned, and, and the sense that we are creating a model community that we hope other people out there will, will, uh, will imitate and will, and will learn from, especially as people go, because we're training rabbis, People go forth from our community, they'll take that community as a model of the kinds of communities they're going to create around the country. So that, that was all in some ways the Chavura, a translation of the Chavura into the world of professional training that rabbinical school is. So in many ways, my whole life has been shaped by, by the Chavura years, my whole project. I sometimes define my project as what I call creating a seeker-friendly Judaism. Um, creating a Judaism that welcomes seekers, and has room for seekers, and people with more questions than answers, and, and so on, and saying, yes, you too belong in this tradition and, and have a place in it and can be leaders of it, um, leaders of it because you're one step ahead of your people around you in seeking, not because you have all the answers, and all of that really is language I would have used already in the Chavara, and sort of comes out of the matrix of that experience. So I think it was... Those were, in some ways, the critical years for me for forming who I am and what I've done, what I've done with my life. Are there ways in which um, those basic ideas that you formed back then uh, in the in the Shalom years, are there ways in which you feel like your life or your, your subsequent thinking has diverged from any of the basic values uh, or ideas that you articulated then or, or were living then? Well, I'm considerably less naive. I do understand that people need to earn a living. Um, so I see reality in a somewhat different way, I would say. But, no, the essential values are very much the same. I feel I've very much tried, tried to live up to the values of those years, which is to say the model of spiritual intensity, the, the, sort, of, uh, the sort of values of the devotional life that I still care about. I have two students I'm very close to, and we all talk about had we been born Catholics, we probably would have been monastics. And I still think of myself as, an, as, as, as a married monastic in some ways, that I really am sort of very committed to this devotional, devotional enterprise, and that we're here to be, stand in the presence of God and, and make that real in our lives, and that's what life is all about. And that is a message I've tried to give to people in various garb while being very intellectually honest about what I do believe and don't believe both about God and tradition. My book Radical Judaism is a pretty strong statement of where I stand in those issues. Um, the devotional focus, uh, that's the sort of life my life is about, is about a kind of spiritual task, is very much still who I am. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm involved at this point in lots and lots of writing projects but one of them is a commentary on the Siddur, which I've been working on for years, and one day will be published with the Siddur, and it's very much a devotional commentary. Another is a two-volume work, which I'm putting out with one of these students, which is now going to be called Anu Hasidism. And Anu Hasidism has two volumes, one called Roots and one called Branches. Roots goes back to Buber and Zeitlin and Heschel and Zalman and Shlomo, and Branches goes moving forward toward creating a new Hasidism, a new Hasidic community, for American Jews today, and as a series of essays by ourselves and by, by various other writers and thinkers and, and, and students. So that's all, that's all very much what I might have been thinking about in 1968. So you founded, and this is my last question, uh, you founded Chavarat Shalom 
almost 50 years ago with what you call the dream, a dream of changing the Jewish world. So half a century later, how do you, how do you assess its impact? It is hard to know. Sometimes I feel we had a tremendous impact on Jewish life. The synagogue, the American synagogue, has become a much less formal and pretentious place. It's a place where the values of community are taken much more seriously in a good synagogue, and where the rabbi is much more a facilitator of community than he, she was ever trained to be in those days. Sometimes I like to think that's partly the impact of the Chavura on the American synagogue community, and that would be a huge impact. But I recognize also that the times have changed, and that that same impact might have happened, might have happened through, through other more broader cultural influences than, than just our voice. Um, still, I think there's a sense, a sense of that new Jewish learning, and a sense of the intensity and, and importance of of real community, our messages that we have conveyed. I think we could have done better. We were purists. We never wanted to create a package. This is how you create a Chavura in your community. We never wanted to be what we call the Holy Mother Church of the Chavura movement. That sounded repulsive to us. We believe that each Chavura has to arise spontaneously out of its own situation and the needs of its own people. And I think that was a mistake. We might have spread the ideal of Chavura uh, more widely, had we been less, adver less averse to public relations and organi organization of effort and things like that. Do you see the Chavaro that uh, sort of grew up within the synagogue context as direct outgrowths in any sense of your... Indirect outgrowths, I would say. There were people who were parallel to us. There were two guys, Harold uh, Schulweiss in California right. and uh, Denny Elkins, Doferitz Elkins in, in New Jersey, who were starting to do it about the same time we were starting Chavurat Shalom. So I don't need to take the credit away from them. But many of those places invited me and others to speak about our Chavurat experience there and, and used us as a sort of strong example of what they wanted to be. So there was a lot of interplay between them. But we're not in a situation today where every synagogue in America has Chavurat. Uh, even some, some synagogues have a Chavurat, but I'd like to see entire congregations divided up into Chavurot, and, and the Chavura ideal much more strongly implanted in the North American Jewish life. What about uh, the idea of independent Minyanim? That have well, so I, so I have some disappointment that we didn't push it in a, more, in a stronger and more organized way. Now, the independent Minyanim of today are very interesting because they annoyingly seem to feel that they've invented this thing. Uh, people like Hadar and the independent Minyanim in various places make it look as though they, uh, in, in sort of the 21st century, came up with this idea that you could have an independent minion. And that's uh, a little bit annoying to the, us Vatikim, who think what they basically did was a second generation of what we did. And, and they sort of enjoy taking credit for it, especially when they line up to take donations from federations, which are using them to save the young people, uh, something we never tried to do and, uh, and feel was, uh, feels a little bit cheesy to us sometimes. But all right, God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts that you want to add before we close? Uh, I'm sure there are a hundred stories we didn't tell and, and a hundred things we could add to this. And I want to just say that we're, we're, we're sorry that Kathy's voice couldn't be heard more clearly. Yes, well... Kathy's voice is, is gone, and uh, I, feel, I feel very, very distressed about that. And she, she was very much a part of this from the beginning, and we did it as a couple, and I couldn't have done it without her. And, uh, and I think our marriage first, and then Michael and Ruthie Brooks, uh, Ruthie uh, 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 those two marriages were in some ways models for the next generation of young married people who came along. And Kathy was just very important in that, in her in her in her quiet but but very but very spiritually alive way and um, i'm really sorry that she's uh as you see almost completely beyond language at this point unless you don't want to say it on camera i'm kind of fascinated by what you had said earlier about referring to the federations as the uden rot it just seems like such a <laughs> i can understand if you don't want to discuss it on camera i just think that's like also 
I, I'm just thinking like in people watching this in the future would find that a sort of like a fascinating comment. Yeah, well, we were pretty radical, and we thought the uh, we thought the we thought that the Jewish establishment was uh, was both corrupt and uh, and uh, fully committed to the to the vacuous uh, the vacuous style that passed for Judaism and the sort of the. No, I don't think I want. To, no, I don't think I want to do it. It's 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 how we felt as twenty-five-year-olds a long time ago, and you know, yeah, yeah not important. Okay. Yeah.